And then you return to the Scottish Government, as we've said, in August um, 2021. And this time your role was as strategic political and policy advisor to the First Minister within the special advisor team. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you remained in that role until the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister of Scotland at the end of March 2023, at which point you also chose to leave government. Is that correct? That is indeed. And you now work in the private sector, I understand. Yes, I do. And I want to turn to ask you about the role of special advisors more generally before we get to your involvement in the pandemic. There is a, there is a special advisors code of conduct, is that correct? There is, yes. And this describes the role of a special advisor as adding a political dimension to the advice and assistance available to ministers. And the code notes that one of the reasons for the role is to reinforce the political impartiality of the permanent civil service so that the political advice can come from the special advisors as opposed to the permanent civil servants. Is that correct? That is correct. And Professor Paul Kearney um, gave evidence uh, in week one to the inquiry. And in his report, he says that special advisors are appointed by the first minister personally and ultimately, the responsibility for the management of the special advisors rests with the First Minister. Is that your understanding? Uh, that is correct. I would say the day-to-day -day management of the special advisor team is delegated to the Chief of Staff. Yes, uh, but ultimately, ultimately responsibility the rests with the First Minister. In your first statement, uh, you say, and I'll simply quote at this stage, Special advisors are not decision takers, but support the decision making process by supporting ministerial thinking and assist in the application, understanding of and communication of uh, ministerial decisions. Therefore, am I correct to understand that the role of a special advisor is not to take the decisions themselves? Uh, that is correct, yes. And there has to be clear boundaries between the decision makers, such as the Scottish ministers and special advisors as it's only the ministers who are elected and therefore accountable to the public. Is that correct? That's correct. And as special advisors, you're neither elected nor accountable to the public. Uh, that is broadly correct, yes. I, I always felt accountable to the public. But in terms but not of formal, formally. Not formally. And your, your role is generally not meant to be public-facing, unlike the politicians, is it? That's correct. And some special advisors can build up close relationships with their ministers, having worked with them over many years. Is that correct? That is. And is it fair to say that your relationship with Nicola Sturgeon was particularly close, having worked as her chief of staff since 2015? Uh, yes, yes. And certainly by the time of the pandemic. And is it fair to say that you were one of her closest confidants? Uh, yes, I would say so. Can we turn to your first statement, which is, um, at, which is on the screen now? It's paragraph 29 and page eight, and here you say, my advice during this period was on the general tenor of the actions being taken, managing public response and the communication of the actions being taken. I played a role on the First Minister's behalf in asking clinicians and officials for more and better advice and raising questions on further action and acted as a sounding board thought partner for the First Minister and others. Can you, are you able to tell me what you mean by thought partner? Um, ministers, the First Minister, but other ministers as well, would receive advice from scientists. They would be looking at, you know, broader information on uh, legislative proposals, policy proposals, and sometimes ministers need a, a place or a person where they can essentially think out loud without that being taken as their definitive view. Um, so my role and the role of other special advisors frequently is to... Um, engage with them to help them stress test ideas, to talk out what might the consequences of a particular route of action be, um, help them come to, you know, are there other questions they should ask? Do they have all the information they need? Um, and to help them explore, if you like, the advice and information before them. So in the context of a particular decision that the First Minister or another Minister needs to make, there may be competing considerations there may be competing almost briefings coming from different interests, whether it be economic, whether it be scientific or medical. And part of the role of the special advisor is to be able to almost stress test the different, perhaps conflicting advice so that the minister can make the decision. Yes, yes. 
Um, in your statements, and I, and I won't take you to this particular part, but I think you say that you would norm, it would be normal for you to attend decision-making meetings with the First Minister where she was in attendance. And this included meetings of the Scottish Government Cabinet, the Scottish Government Resilience Room, the Gold Meetings, COBRA Meetings, and the Four Nation Calls with Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. Is that correct? That's correct. So it's fair to say that you were a particularly important part of the Scottish Government's response to the pandemic until at least March 2021. Is that correct? Um, that's for others to judge, but I was certainly there and certainly participating in the response. You were there in almost all the yes. meet, important yes. meetings and in the rooms where the decisions were being made. Yes. And you were the thought partner or the sounding board for the First Minister when it came to stress testing perhaps the different conflicting advice that was being received. Yes. And there would be, I think, is it fair to say, there'd be very few people within the Scottish Government that would perhaps be in the room for all the key meetings with the First Minister during the course of the pandemic? During the course of the pandemic, um, it was common for, there would be a few other people that you would see at most of the meetings. So the Cabinet Secretary for Health would be present very frequently. Um, the Deputy First Minister was present a lot, sometimes remotely, because um, for reasons he would be working from home. Uh, Ken Thompson, um, the Chief Medical Officer, or one of the other medical advisors. But there was a core group who were, um, in St Andrew's House a lot and in a lot of those meetings together. And you were part of and that. I was part of that, yeah. Can we turn to your uh, first statement and it's at paragraph 36, page 9. And here I think you say, I would not say I advised on the adoption or not of specific NPIs, it's non-pharmaceutical interventions. Mm -hmm. That was for the clinicians and officials, but I would have given views at certain points on the interpretation of the data, of public mood and compliance, of communications, and where there was politics involved, for example, securing the support of other parties or governments, or impacts on stakeholders, such as through border controls, on that aspect. So, is it your position that you did not advise on the adoption or not of specific NPIs? I think when certain NPIs were on the table in that thought partner role, um, there would be perhaps conversations between myself and the First Minister as to which ones, or exchanges as to which ones to use. Um, that could perhaps be considered advice on the adoption, but it was not, I think what it meant is I didn't decide on the adoption. Yes, so you advised, but I think your position, I think more accurately is you didn't make the ultimate decision. Yes, nor did I sort of say, here is your selected list of NPIs. They would come in proposals from the Chief Medical Officer, for example, and we would then discuss the kind of things that were on the table. Can we turn to some WhatsApp messages that you have disclosed to the inquiry between yourself and Nicola Sturgeon? I will come back to the circumstances of the disclosure later on. Okay. But first of all, can we turn to INQ 00028776? And we're looking at um, page nine. And by way of context, um, the Scottish Government announced the rules that permitted 20 people at funerals, weddings and civil partnerships. And those rules kicked into force on the 14th of September 2020. Mm -hmm. And Nicola Sturgeon was due to announce new restrictions to the Scottish Parliament on the 22nd of September 2020. And in fact, the usual briefing time um, was changed from 12.15 that day to 2.20 that afternoon. And here we have an exchange of messages. This is shortly before Nicola Sturgeon was due to make the announcement about the new restrictions that day. And this exchange relates to a discussion about whether the rules should be mm -hmm. changed for weddings, civil partnerships and funerals. If we start by reading the top message, so Nicola Sturgeon says, and this is on the 22nd of September at 12.09, so shortly before she's due to make the public announcement, we haven't thought about weddings. They are reducing, but not sure what to. And you reply, I think as we only just put them up, just leave it. Then you go on to say, they aren't reducing churches, etc. as far as I know. And I think, though we'll check, that they were higher than us. And then you say, they had 30, we have 20. Then you say, they are going to 15 and 30 at funerals. I think we stay at 20. Does the they in this conversation refer to the UK government? Yes, it does. So Nicola Sturgeon in this example tells you at around 10 past 12, 
the day that she's due to make the announcement to the public, the usual time being 12.15, but this day we see yeah. that it was moved to 20. She tells you that she's not sure about what to do. And you tell her to stay with 20 attendees when the UK government has gone down from 30 to 15. And that ultimately becomes the decision that day, because there is no change to the, the position of 20, as far as the inquiry is aware. So is this not an example of a decision that was made very much at the last minute over WhatsApp between you and Nicola Sturgeon? So there are a number of aspects to this exchange. Um, the decision, I don't view this as the decision because the decision had been taken. So a decision had been taken at Cabinet to go to 20 through the normal processes. And where the First Minister is saying we haven't thought about weddings, there had been significant thought by, I think, the communities and equalities team about what were the appropriate numbers of people at particular services. Um, so that decision had been taken, that decision had gone through the proper process. Um, and I give my view that I don't think we need to essentially remake that decision. I think the message underneath that is, says that the statement is being forwarded to her, which is, I think, the Prime Minister's statement. And had she still wanted to take further action, she could have come back on that. Um, I also think behind this WhatsApp, if you like, I was having an exchange with the lead official to make sure I had the information correct and that the information I was giving the First Minister was the right information. Is a decision not to change the rules still a decision? I think there had been a positive, if you like, and a proactive decision at Cabinet that the position in Scotland was that there would be 20. Um, there is neither a confirmation or, a, you know, if the First Minister had come back and said, I agree, then I would support your view that that was a decision. She actually doesn't comment and there may be other actions elsewhere. I don't think it did change from memory until later on. Um, but this, to my mind, is me giving my advice, my thought in that thought partnership role that we stay at 20. If she had wanted to pursue it, to consider it further, perhaps after receiving the statement she may have, there would be exchanges in some other fashion. There wasn't any scientific briefing that you received that appears to have informed your view, let's stick with 20, was there? There would have been on the decision, which had very recently, I think that, you know, a day or two before been taken to set it at 20. I believe that the decision to move it down to 20 had been taken around maybe the 10th of September and the decision had come into force on the 14th of September. And what we are talking about is here looking at the 22nd of September. And from the documents that have been disclosed to the inquiry, um, there, between the inquiries looked at the, mm -hmm. all of the documents between the 10th of September and the 23rd of September. And there, the inquiry can see no advice being given between these dates about whether the number should remain at 20 or whether it should go up or down. So is this not an example of a decision simply being made on the hoof um, shortly before the First Minister is meant to be announcing restrictions? I would think that advising that shortly before the statement on restrictions was about to be made, that a decision should be taken to change the limit without seeking scientific advice would have been the on the hoof aspect, suggesting that you stick at the decision that had been taken based on information was a more coherent position. Uh, but we can see that Nicola Sturgeon's first uh, WhatsApp to use, we haven't thought about weddings. That seems to suggest that there wasn't really much thought process that had gone into the decision until this exchange with you, uh, which begins at around 10 past 12. No, I think, I think she means we haven't thought about changing weddings, if you like, in response to the UK government changing weddings. We had thought about weddings when the decision had been taken positively and proactively in Cabinet to set the limit at 20. So is it fair to say that because Nicola Sturgeon comes to you sim not being sure what to do and ultimately, as the inquiry has seen, that uh, on this date there was no change to mm -hmm. the rules and you're the one that suggests that, you, that we stay at 20, are you effectively the main driver of this decision? No, I don't think so. If the First Minister has a, the First Minister has a strong enough mind that if she had felt that my advice was not the right advice... Um, she would have said so, or she would have acted in another capacity, asked for further advice, delayed the position on weddings. She would have acted on that. Um, I am advising. I 
sought the correct information, if you like, on the factual basis to give that advice, but the decision is very much his. If these messages had been deleted by you, and they haven't because that's why we have them, if these messages had been deleted by you, how would the inquiry and the public be able to understand how and why the, the decision was made at this time not to change the number of people that can attend funerals or weddings? So, as I've said in this regard, I have recollection of contacting, I think on Teams, um, the official responsible for the sort of framework documents, if you like, to check my facts, to check what it was. Um, they would be able to see the decision that was made, which was the decision to stay at 20 being made previously, essentially the decision to set at 20, through the process of advice and cabinet papers. So that decision would be very set out in very great detail. The exchange I will have had with the official will have said the First Minister is asking about weddings. What's the position? But ultimately, the public, if this message had been deleted, the, the public would, and the inquiry would not know that the decision ultimately, the First Minister, as at 10 past 12 that day, wasn't sure what to do. And in fact, within a couple of hours when she announced the restrictions, she'd reached a view that the, that the numbers would not be changed. And all of that had occurred within a very short time involving a WhatsApp discussion with you. Uh, that wouldn't be the sort of insight that the public or the inquiry would have if these messages had been deleted. Is that correct? I think there may not be that insight into, if you like, the moment of, oh, should we think about this? The sort of the reflection on is the advice that we have at the moment the correct advice? Um, but they would know why the decision on weddings was that there should be 20 people. And the reflection is part of the decision making process, isn't it? Um, it can be. I think in this it is a, a, are the UK doing something that we should be doing? That will be, I would expect, to find in notes from officials providing this is what the UK is doing and considering in slower time, perhaps before the next update of the regulations, should we adopt any of this? Um, but that, that split second, if you like, of indecision would not necessarily be recorded elsewhere. But so can I just confirm, so do you agree with me that this would be an important part of the spe specific decision that was under contemplation here on this date, this exchange? I think if it had been... I don't want to dispute this too strongly, but I, I don't want to over sort of state the importance of this particular decision. There had been a, you know, every week there was a review of what the decisions were, what the appropriate steps were, what actions should be taken. And they were done in a very meticulous fashion. Um, <coughs> and there will be occasions where people have a moment of, oh, is that right? And they might ask a special advisor, they might ask a policy official, they might ask the clinical advisor that happens to be in the room with them. Um, those moments are quite human. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to overstate the importance of this as opposed to the importance of the proper process that was followed that set the limit at 20, because that was a very diligent process. Both, both processes, the formal and the informal, have their place, don't they? They do. Decision -making they do. Process. And part of it is you've got the formal frameworks, whether it's a cabinet, yeah. but you've also got the human side that you've touched upon, which is as being a thought partner or a sounding board, where you get to see people's real, maybe struggles with the decisions that they're making, uh, needing different viewpoints and insights. And together that forms the full context to that decision, doesn't it? Yes, I think there can, there can be moments where a bit of perhaps reassurance is required or and uh, uh, making sure that we essentially don't take informal decisions when formal decisions have been taken. So had there been a decision here to change, that would have been a decision based on no scientific advice at all, taken in you know, the space of 20 minutes. When you have a full proper process, this is essentially deferring back to the proper formal process. The formal process, which I think in this instance had occurred about 12 days before or yes. there or thereabouts. Yes. Can we turn to INQ 00287766? This is, again, your WhatsApp messages. We're looking at page 35. So could um, that be made just a touch bigger? Uh, I think they will co hopefully come on screen a little bit bigger. A little um, We are looking at... Does that help? Yes, that does help. Thank, Thank you. you. Helps me as well, so I think <laughs> we can both read. So this is a discussion between you and Nicola Sturgeon about the number of people who could meet indoors mm -hmm from March 2021. 
So if we look at the first message, it's from you saying, when you respond on cabinet paper in June, could we make it six and three indoors? It's just much more normal. Can I just pause there? What's the significance of the number six and three? Uh, I believe that would be six people, three households. And then if we, um, Nicola Sturgeon's reply is, that will be better after four and three mid-May, I assume. You reply saying indoors, April 4, 2, May 6, 2 is what I currently have. Nicola Sturgeon replies, is that indoors in pubs, etc.? Thought we were waiting till May for indoor households. You reply saying we appear to be waiting till June for indoors at home. You also reply, so in pubs, etc., it's 4-2 in April, 6-2 in May, and then in June, it should go to 6-3, and we allow you to meet in your own home. Um, you reply, you again say, cabinet paper doesn't actually run all the way to June, but my mock graphics do. Nicola Sturgeon replies, we should bring indoor houses to mid-May. Um, you reply, saying, can you make that your feedback, or do you want me to do it? Yeah. And she replies, I'll do it. Um, so if we pause there... Um, in this exchange, um, you are pushing for, or maybe advising, advising. That, that there is a change of the rules on the amount of people who can socialise indoors. Is that right? So this refers to a proposal. So the numbers 4262, I'm not just pulling those out of the air. This is a proposal in a draft of a cabinet paper um, and in a draft set of communications material um, that I am looking at. And suggesting to the First Minister that I don't think the final part of the proposal, which is not in the Cabinet paper, but is in um, these communications materials, doesn't really work, in my view. I think your reasoning given is it's just much more normal. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? Um, sometimes when you looked at the advice that was given, um, you had to think through what will this mean for people living their lives in practice? Um, and how might people want to function? What would people consider a return to normality if that's what you're trying to do? And although we had previously had 6-2 regulations, I think, the year before, um, I actually think what I was reflecting on here was 6-3 possibly enabled more of a sort of families to gather in a slightly easier way. But I think you accept, or would you accept, that just it, the explanation being it's just much more normal isn't very scientific, is it? it it is not, um, I agree, it is not hugely scientific, but one of the things that you have to do, or that certainly I felt was necessary in this, and it, this was not a function unique to me, is to think when you have a set of <coughs> regulations, they are not proposed. It often felt like they were proposed in the abstract without considering the way in which people function um, in their real life. And particularly around how people interact with each other, you are seeking to balance caution and protection from the virus with the kind of normality that might be good for people in a more societal sense. Was that a consistent theme up till your involvement till March 2021, that the advice that you were scientific and medical advice that you were receiving often seemed very much in the abstract, devoid of, kind of the real world and how people live? Um, I think... I don't want to suggest that the people giving the advice were sort of abstract and devoid of, of understanding, but it was their job to provide, you know, what is the appropriate regulation at a very, on a very strict basis. It was not their job to consider what does this mean for people's mental health? What does it mean for their family relationships? They were there to consider what will keep the R number to its lowest level, if you like. Um, there were other people who would feed in points about, well, actually, if you could make a slight tweak to that, does that make it better for people societally or in a mental health sense? And what's the impact of that on, uh, is that, does that have serious consequences? Is that a move we have space to make, if you like? So it wasn't strictly the case that the Scottish government was following the science because the science had a role to play, but there was this other element that, that you would, for instance, and other special advisors and indeed other stakeholders would bring into the decision that wouldn't necessarily be science-based? I think the science underpinned everything. Um, and if you suggested changes, if ministers wanted to do something different, there would normally be a sort of referral back to see if we could calculate what that might do if a minister proposed something that would push the R or that, that would be calculated or modelled to push the R number above, then that 
would likely not be taken forward. So you were underpinned by the science and, if you like, cautioned by the science in how far you could go. But not necessarily, the science wasn't the be-all and end-all of the Scottish Government's approach. Um, it was dominant, but I don't think you can take decisions in this situation without being aware of other factors. And what we see here in this exchange is that um, there is a decision to go to Cabinet with, I think, what yourself and the First Minister have discussed, and that's going to be Nicola Sturgeon's view uh, presented to Cabinet in terms of the change of rules. Well, it, this confirms that it's going to be her feedback to the Cabinet paper. That would create an opportunity if the clinicians, for example, thought that was inappropriate for them to come back on her feedback, and this would all be in formal exchanges if, if they did this to say, First Minister, actually, we would rather not do that, and this is why we would rather not do that. Is it fair to describe the role of the Scottish, uh, Scottish Cabinet at times as being a decision-making ratifying body as opposed to a decision-making body? So it ratified decisions that made, had been made elsewhere, whether it's in informal communications, whether it's in gold command meetings, or in other one-on-one -on -one discussions between key decision-makers, and the role of Cabinet was at times simply just to ratify those decisions? Um, no, I don't think so. I think everything that went to Cabinet was a proposal. Um, and Cabinet ministers would push back sometimes, ask for amendments, ask for changes. Some decisions may be deferred because Cabinet members wanted more information or the First Minister wanted more information. There was an extensive process of engagement with clinicians, advisers and cabinet ministers before the cabinet paper would come to cabinet. So there would be opportunities prior Were there... to cabinet for people to feed in. But there would also be genuine discussion at cabinet. And would there often be instances where the ultimate decision was delegated by cabinet to, for instance, Nicola Sturgeon or John Swinney? There were certainly occasions where cabinet would agree to delegate a decision, yes. And what sorts of decisions do you recall that were delegated to Nicola Sturgeon or John Swinney during your involvement in the pandemic? Um, decisions that were delegated were tended to be sometimes in the relationship to the communications around a decision, um, sometimes in relation to the timing of the announcement of a decision, um, and sometimes where an additional piece of information or a piece of analysis was to come in um, and cabinet members would have the chance to put their views in writing or to speak directly to the First Minister, but there would not be another cabinet meeting called. Um, if, for example, you had the cabinet meeting, say, on the Tuesday and you were looking at something that you might announce on the Thursday and an additional piece of information was requested, you wouldn't necessarily recall cabinet. The final decision would be delegated to the First or Deputy First Minister, but cabinet members would have the opportunity to comment on the additional information that came in in between. Was an example of a decision that was delegated to Nicola Sturgeon or maybe perhaps John Swinney around the local restrictions? Do you remember when the level system mm -hmm. came in and decision making around, for instance, whether Glasgow would remain in level three or two or Edinburgh would go up or down? Is that the sort of detail that was delegated to the First Minister to make? Um, you would have a broader discussion uh, around what the levels would be. But the final check, if you like, on the morning of the announcement against that day's figures would be delegated. So to check that there wasn't a need to um, adjust, if you like, what had been agreed in the broader discussion. Um, that's maybe an, an issue that we'll explore with further um, later witnesses. I wanted to turn to the political strategy behind the Scottish Government's response to the pandemic. Is it fair to say that you've spent a lot of your career, perhaps less so now, strategising about Scottish independence? Um, I think supporters of Scottish independence might be disappointed with what my answer is, but um, not as much as people would have thought or would have liked. Um, a large part of my political career has been spent strategising about what the Scottish Government does in other policy areas. But yes, I have had a role throughout in the progress of Scottish independence. And how many years would you say that you've had a role in the strategy for independence? Um, probably from around about 2012. Can we turn to the Cabinet Minute from the 30th of June 2020? If we look at the first page, you'll see that this is a Cabinet meeting which is attended by um, everyone uh, in terms of the Cabinet secretaries that you would expect, uh, including the First Minister, and you're also in attendance as uh, mm -hmm. you're noted as a special advisor. 
Can we turn to page 13, paragraph 56E? And you'll see here that one of the cabinet conclusions is, and, it, and if it can be, uh, thank you, um, if I can read, it says, agreed that consideration should be given to restarting work on independence and a referendum with the arguments reflecting the experience of the coronavirus crisis and the developments on EU exits. So this is a cabinet conclusion, and it's from the 30th of June 2020. Are you able to tell us what the significance of our cabinet conclusion is? Um, yes, so you would have a cabinet paper. I think in this case it was on EU exit. Um, and at the end of a cabinet paper, there are normally a set of actions proposed. Um, and this would have been one of the actions proposed in the paper on EU exit. Um, I, the fact that something is in the cabinet conclusion does not necessarily mean there was an active discussion on that particular issue. So this is E, so there would have been five points in the EU exit paper. Um, I have, uh, as, as you know, I have contemporary, contemporaneous notes of uh, some of these meetings. If we had had a discussion on independence in the constitution, it would have been in my notes. I was the chief political advisor to the government. It is not. Um, so my recollection and what that tells me is that there was no substantive discussion on issues around independence and a referendum at this meeting. There was a discussion around EU exit, and this had been included in the paper. We've already discussed uh, that there's a place for formal uh, mm -hmm. structures and informal discussions yeah. within the decision-making process. One can't get any more formal in terms of decision-making than what's in the Cabinet minutes mm -hmm. as the agreed actions. Do you accept that? Yes. And it carries perhaps more weight about what the Scottish Government is seeking to do than informal notes that may exist, um, this being in a Cabinet meeting minutes? Normally I would agree with you, um, and in the other points I do. What strikes me about this point is it was agreed that consideration should be given. It wasn't agreed that we would do something other than think. Um, and the following this period, no action is taken on independence or a referendum during this period. So to the end of 2020. Um, if it had been, I would have been involved in it. There is nothing that I am aware of that the government proactively did. Um, if the government had proactively done something, there would be much evidence of it. There would be published papers, there would be statements, and there would be occasions in Parliament. This was a focus on the fact that we were about to leave the EU, which was during 2020, the dominant constitutional concern of the Scottish Government. So when do you say that independence became a subject matter under discussion in the Scottish Government during the pandemic? Um, it generally didn't. Um, so I worked on the pandemic March 2020 to March 2021. One of the first steps we did was suspend work on independence in the referendum. The team that worked on it was disbanded and sent to work on COVID-related activities. Uh, there are a few references that I can think of in the programme for government of the following year. So that would be the programme for government 21-22, um, where there's maybe one or two paragraphs and they make clear that any action would be contingent on the state of the COVID pandemic. Um, I don't think anything happens until at least after the 2021 election. But there is, from late 2020, there's some press coverage where other politician parties are telling the, the Scottish Government to stop talking or concentrating on independence and focusing on the pandemic response. Do you rec recall those sorts of press coverage starting from late 2020 going into early 2021? Um, I don't mean to be flippant in this reply, but any um, breath of the word independence would lead the opposition parties to say you are focusing on independence over the pandemic. Um, you could have been working 18 hours, 20 hours a day on the pandemic, not seen anything on independence for the course of the year. It would not stop an opposition member saying that we were focusing too much on independence. I will come back to the topic of independence. Um, can we look now at your notebook? And this is at INQ 00034641. And just before we look at the specific um, uh, page, can you explain um, what the purpose of your notebook was? 
Um, I kept notes through most of the year on COVID of cabinet meetings, of COBRA meetings, of score meetings, in essence, to keep myself right in what had been agreed, what had been discussed, what my actions were, um, what I should be expecting different parts of the government to deliver over the week. It was my um, way of keeping on top of what was happening. Can we turn to the entry on page 142? And you'll see at the top, this is headed Gold Command, and these appear to be notes from a Gold Command meeting mm -hmm. that took place on the 28th of September 2020. Can we now turn over the page? And if we're able to increase the size on the second page shown on the screen. Thank you. Just by way of, um, I think we would, um, so just by way of context, first of all, this is, are your notes on a discussion of a potential circuit breaker lockdown yeah. around, I think this was being discussed in September, going into October 2020, is that correct? That's correct. And if we are able to look at the, um, I'm just waiting for these it's the next page. And it might be, if, if I can read out yeah. your notes, that <laughs> might assist. Uh, I think we almost had it, but I'll read. So there's, I, can, I can just about read this. So yes, so there's, carry a, on. There's, there's a note that's written on, uh, yes, I think that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and it reads, navigate economy, avoid blunt instruments, then it says, I think, is it FM or FH? No. I think that's FM. FM, no finances. Oh, no, sorry, that's FH. The next line down is FM. Yes. Who could you tell us? Who uh, that would, would be Fiona Hislop. Fiona Hislop says, no finances. And the First Minister says, starting point, how do we reduce impact of spread with minimal economic impact? And then there's your handwritten notes, political tactics, calling for things uh, we can't do to force UK. Do you see that? Yes. So your note suggests that the Scottish government's political strategy was to create what might be seen as a public spat with the UK government to force their hands. What was the um, political advantages of um, that sort of strategy? It's not about a spat. Um, this would be about putting pressure on the UK government. Um, it's not deliberately falling out in the ideal world. They would have um, accepted the points that we were making to them. Um, for, if I can give a bit of context and then get to that, this is weighing up how we could um, put further restrictions on potentially a circuit breaker with minimal economic impact because the Scottish Government didn't have the means to uh, provide economic support to individuals or, or businesses if we went for the full circuit breaker. What we needed was the UK Treasury to open up additional funding, to extend furlough, to take actions that would enable us to do that. And this, I think, is about us setting out very clearly what we wanted to do in public health terms, but what we couldn't do to try and build pressure on the UK government who um, were not amenable to this discussion in private um, to force a change of position. And you would need to do that publicly, and that's the reference to the political tactic, yes. is that correct? We've heard evidence from witnesses, including Professor Davy Sridhar, of the importance of cohesion in the response between the UK government and the Scottish government, and this is in the context of public health. These tactics, whether you can call them political tactics, of going pu uh, public would create more division with the UK government, wouldn't they? Um, as I said, in an ideal situation, the UK government would have agreed that funding would be provided so that the Scottish government could put in place the public health restrictions that we wanted and then there would have been no need for any pressure um sorry that it's disappeared from the screen um the purpose of this is not division it's not to have an argument it's to be able to put in place the public health restrictions that we were being advised were required at that time when private discussions do not get you to the place where you have access to the finances that you need to do that um you have to explain to the public why you're not doing it. And in opening that up, it's been very clear that it is the UK government's decision not to provide finances that is impacting on your ability 
to put in place the public health measures that you want. Um, I don't call that a spat. I don't, put, although I wrote political tactic, it's not partisan. It's not about boosting or, you know, uh, knocking support for one government or one party. It's about trying to do the job that we were trying to do and finding ourselves very frustrated in doing. And why did you feel, in terms of intergovernmental relations, that you needed to go public with your concerns and you weren't able to raise these privately with the UK government? I mean, there would be a number of issues that we would resolve privately, but this one was not being resolved privately. Um, we were in this position, the Welsh Government were in this position, the Northern Irish Government were in this position, and we were making no headway. Um, so you reach a, a point where you have to say to the people you represent why you are not able to do something that you are being advised to do. That means going public on the fact that you can't afford it. That means going public on the fact that you may have asked the Treasury for money and they're not providing it. Um, it's not a, we are doing this to stir up political contest. It's, we can't do what we're trying to do and we need to tell you why. Can we go back to your WhatsApp messages, and this time, my lady, I wanted to give a warning that there will be some bad language in oh. some of these. Um, I'm used to it. Yes. I think it's partly for the broadcasters rather than your ladyship. Apologies. <laughs> I, I thought I'd been quite restrained. <laughs> and we're looking at page 20. Oh, it's uh, not my language. <laughs> yes. And just to give some context, on the 31st of October 2020 at 6.30 p.m., Prime Minister Boris Johnson began his address announcing the second national lockdown. And I want to pick up the messages between yourself and Nicola Sturgeon, which starts 10 minutes into the address. So if we read the first message on the 31st of October at um, 6.40, you say, hitting the 15 minutes between the rugby and strictly to lock the country up. Let us never do this like this. Nicola Sturgeon replies, their comms are behind awful. We're not perfect, but we don't get nearly enough credit for how be much better than them we are. She then replies, this is fucking excruciating. Their comms are awful. Then she goes on to say, his utter incompetence in every sense is now offending me on behalf of politicians everywhere. You reply saying, I have a separate WhatsApp with, and the name's redacted, and Davy, and we are offended on behalf of spads everywhere. Nicola Sturgeon says, he is a fucking clown. So was there a perception amongst Nicola Sturgeon and the wider Scottish government that it was doing so much better than the UK government in the pandemic response around this time? Um, I think this refers specifically to the, the communications aspect of the response. And um, that's sometimes dismissed, but communications is very important in a public health situation. People need to know what to do and why and to understand it and to trust in it. Um, and this was the end result of a, a day that had been um, quite symbolic in uh, the UK government. And that has an impact on what people see and think in Scotland about the pandemic as overall. So while he was announcing something that was not relevant to Scotland, um, the sort of chaos that appeared around some of the decisions they took uh, we then had to work hard to mitigate because people in Scotland see both. Um, and so, yeah, we were clearly not very complimentary about their communications handling that day. Is it fair to say that the relationship between Nicola Sturgeon and Boris Johnson by this date had completely broken down? Um, I think broken down to a degree overstates what was there to break. Um, they had... Uh, met on a number of occasions, there was always a, a politeness, a, a business-like approach to it. Um, when Boris Johnson first became Prime Minister and came to meet Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, they had a discussion that I think has been described publicly as well as it was more like a debate, you know, two intelligent people um, engaged in discussion about policy issues. When we got to COVID, I think it was much harder um, it was evident in his exchanges with the Scottish Government, with the First Minister, and I think with the other First Ministers, because we would all be on the same call, um, that he didn't want to be on those calls. Um, he wasn't necessarily well briefed on those calls, and he wasn't listening to the points we were making on those calls. Um, and so I think 
engagement with him came to be seen as um, slightly pointless during this period. And I think it's going as early as is it, it was March 2020, I think in one of your notes you described Cobra as a shambles. Yes. Um, did you, was that the view that you had from very early on, from March 2020, that the Prime Minister wasn't really wanting to engage with yes. the Scottish Government? Yes. And how did that then affect from the Scottish Government its working relationship with the UK Government and the working relationship between the First Minister and the Prime Minister? I think in relation to the Scottish Government and the UK Government in broader terms, um, there was fairly constant and fairly good um, communication and cooperation, I mean, particularly in health. This is evident, and at times, not always, but at times in the economic space. Um, and I think officials at all levels sort of had discussions that were quite good. But the discussions between the First Minister and the Prime Minister and other First Ministers, I mean, it was, very, it was never bilateral. There were always the First Minister of Wales and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland on these calls as well. Um, they they didn't get us anywhere. So we started with a very clear approach that we should all try to work together and moving into lockdown was all done in a coordinated fashion. But when you got to what I think the First Minister wanted to be substantive discussions about what direction to go in, a thrashing out of different proposals and different ideas, that wasn't what we got. Um, we got a <coughs> Prime Minister who it certainly felt at the end of the video screen or at the end of the line was, uh, reading a script and would summarise the contributions of the three first ministers and the deputy first minister from Northern Ireland um, in ways which largely ignored the points that they had made. And how early on in the pandemic response did you come to that realisation? Um, it was difficult. I mean, it was more effective at the beginning, sort of March, although it was obvious that they were not you know, hugely keen on having us there and being in the room. Um, it was actually quite effective with Dominic Raab for the period in which the Prime Minister was in hospital. Um, and it's when the Prime Minister sort of re-engages in the discussions that it is evident, as you're talking about, the lifting of restrictions, for example, um, changes in messaging, different approaches between Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the UK, um, that he is not informed and doesn't want to be there. And I think there, there seems to be kind of a very clear divergence in messaging from around the 10th of May 2020. You recall that's where the UK government messaging stayed to move to stay alert. The Scottish government remained at stay at home. Was that the point, if, there, if we're trying to identify in terms of timeline, where there was now clear divergence in the approach between the two governments? Or did it occur earlier than that? I think that's the point where it becomes clear that there is going to be a difference in approach between the two governments, that, that the approach to lifting restrictions in England is going to be different to the approach to lifting restrictions in Scotland and Wales in Northern Ireland. Um, and that I think the sort of um, philosophy or ideology behind the lifting of restrictions was coming from a different place. Um, so... That is, I think, the point at which it becomes clear that we're going to go in slightly different directions and we have to try and work out how to go in different directions um, within uh, the UK as a whole. If the First Minister of Scotland thought that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was a clown or utterly incompetent, that doesn't really uh, create any sort of functioning relationship between the two leaders of the respective governments, does it? I mean, this is later than that point that you raised earlier about May. Um, but which point, I, I can't think of conversations in this period that were happening directly with the Prime Minister. They were happening with Michael Gove. Can we now turn to page 21? And we are now looking, we've now moved on to the 1st of November 2020. And I wanted to look at messages that begin at 6.29pm. Mm -hmm. And here you say, and I quote, my reason for setting a timeline for them to answer us on furlough is purely political, especially as we expect the answer to be no. It looks awful for them, and creating that kind of pressure could possibly result in a yes. 
though agree we shouldn't bank on it. Think I want a good old fashioned Rami, so can you think about something other than sick so can think about something other than sick people? And Nicola Sturgeon replies, yeah, I get it, and it might be worth doing. I've sent a rough uh, formulation of what I might say tomorrow. I, I could for it in there. So if we pause there, can you help us? What do you mean by good old fashioned Rami with the UK government? Um, I think this is an expression of frustration um, uh, that we were not able to manage the pandemic at this point in time in the way that we wanted. Um, and I mean, a good old fashioned Rami is language I would rarely use, actually, but, you know, is that we needed to have the argument in public. There were a lot of things in COVID where we didn't have the argument in public. Um, there were a lot of things in COVID where uh, the UK government did something and we just let it go, or they didn't do something and we just let it go. Um, I particularly felt this issue of furlough at a time when we wanted to apply restrictions and furlough was ending was, uh, was materially important to the handling of the pandemic. It was a hindrance to our ability to handle the pandemic. And I can't deny, I, I was angry about that position because it really did block our ability to do what we wanted to do. Um, so uh, I think the message reflects that frustration, perhaps bubbling over a little bit. Yes, I think earlier on, we'd looked at your notebook and the entry from the gold commands from the 28th of September. And I think you'd said, you take an issue with how I'd characterize it as a public spat. By this stage, on the 1st of November, you are looking for a public spat with the UK government. Is that fair to say? I, I am definitely looking, I, you know, I'm clearly looking to air the issue strongly and publicly. Um, and as I say, in the vague hope that it might get as an answer, might get as a yes. Um, You're looking for a public spat. I'm looking for a public spat for a purpose. Public spat could often deliver results. Um, if the public pressure on the UK government was... Uh, there, it had been shown in the past that they would sometimes change their mind if they felt that pressure. And what I want them to do is change their mind. So the discussion is whether the furlough scheme should be available to Scotland, because at this stage, England had just had entered into the second national lockdown in England. And you're setting what is effectively a political trap for the UK government if it refuses to extend the furlough scheme to Scotland. It looks awful for them and strengthens the argument for independence, because you need to go alone. Or if it extends the furlough scheme to Scotland, there is additional funding available to Scotland. Therefore, for the Scottish government, a good old fashioned Rami with the UK government is a win-win situation. Is that not the essence of the point that you're making here, that you're looking for this from purely political perspectives? I would dispute that there's any issue of independence in this. Um, so I am keen, very keen, that we get a yes in this situation and that we are able to enact the restrictions at the time, public health restrictions at the timing the Scottish Government deems appropriate with the financial support that should come with that. Um, if there is a no, what looks awful for them is that they are not enabling us to take public health steps at the time that we want. If the wider world wants to read constitutional implications into that, that is for them, but I was not making them. And it was around this time that I think the furlough scheme was extended to Scotland in November. Is that correct? It ultimately was. There was significant pressure, um, public pressure placed on the UK government. Ultimately, it did it because it did it for England. Um, and this was the issue, was that finance decisions that related to mitigating public health measures were not... Uh, coordinated with the decisions each of the four nations might make on those public health measures. They were only triggered, if you like, when England took a decision and Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all faced significant difficulties during this period for that um, reason. Can we turn to now page 23 in these WhatsApp messages? And here, just by way of context, what's being discussed here is efforts to have a four nations approach to restrictions over Christmas in 2020. And you'll see um, messages um, that from you that begin at 9.04 p.m. And you say, Gove wants to talk tomorrow, it's just come in, have said to, and there's a name redacted, to hold off going back till the morning and suggest waiting for the proposal before agreeing. Nicola Sturgeon replies, I've just seen the email. I'm happy to do call subject to proposal, but I wonder if we should make clear in advance we won't agree anything without cabinet approval and get Wales to sign up to that. 
You reply saying, yep, Cabinet Tuesday is a good marker. Tuesday or Wednesday might not be bad days for us to announce either. I'm increasingly leaning to just one other household after seeing the poll, but I'm also a Grinch about Christmas. And then Nicola Sturgeon replies, I am too. But on, but on this, I reluctantly think there's merit in the UK-wide position. Let's see the proposal. So Nicola Sturgeon's reply to you on the 20th of November seems, she seems to be emphasising that she's reluctantly seeing the merit in the UK-wide position. Does this not suggest that by this stage, the default position for the Scottish government was to be different from the UK government? I think it was the default position for each of the four governments to take the decisions that suited their geographical and pandemic-related circumstances. It was not that we would be different to the UK or different to Wales. It was that in taking the right decisions for the people we were responsible to, the Scottish people, they were not necessarily the same decisions that the UK was taking. But Nicola Sturgeon doesn't appear to be very enthusiastic about Four Nations' approach by this time, does she? Where I, she's almost reluctantly having to sign up to it. I think there was a reluctance in general around Christmas positioning. We uh, were essentially bounced by the UK government into a position about Christmas, telling people they can't have it when the UK government have said you can um, was a very difficult situation to be put in. Um, there is a reluctance... And you can see this higher up, you know, subject to the proposal, we're reading in the public domain that people will be getting some sort of relief from COVID over Christmas. We have not seen a proposal that we are about to go onto a phone call and be asked to agree to. So this again goes to some of that, what was to us a chaotic and shambolic sort of approach. So it's um, very hard to sign up to something and to enthusiastically embrace something that you have had no input into. Were your advisors, whether it be scientific, clinical or medical advisors, advising you about the benefits of having a cohesive approach uh, across the UK around the restrictions over Christmas 2020? Um, the, yes, to an extent, um, in part because of travel. Um, and it was travel that uh, led us largely to, to look for a, a cohesive approach. Um, what I recall of the advice from advisors around Christmas was, you know, we don't think this is a good idea. Make it as minimal as you can if you have to do it at all. And I now want to move on um, in the period two. You left your role as Chief of Staff in March 2021. And you say that after a short break, you came into the role of Strategic Political and Policy Advisor to the First Minister in August 2021. I think you say in your statement that you didn't have any involvement in the pandemic response beyond this date, except for COP26, which took place in Glasgow, I think, in November 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. On the 7th of September 2021, Nicola Sturgeon announced that work would start again on the second independence referendum campaign. Does this announcement, or did this announcement, coincide with your change of position from Chief of Staff to becoming the Chief Political Advisor and Strategic... Um, it, it broadly coincides in date terms, but it doesn't coincide in reason. Um, I did not take a post. My post was not involved in any move on independence. Oh. I attended the odd phone call, but it was not. It was far from the principal purpose of my job. What was the principal purpose of your job um, after August 2021? Um, initially, it was the COP26 summit and to lead the sort of Scottish government's policy work in preparation for that. Um, it was then to focus, and this was something I had felt as Chief of Staff we were missing, was to step back from the front line, from the media, from the parliament, from the day to day, and to focus on some of the long-term commitments that we had as a government and that we'd made in the 2021 election around moving to renewable energy, around reaching net zero, around tackling child poverty. So I worked on things like um, the new economic strategy, the draft energy strategy, the resource spending review, um, I attended some of the Constitution Secretary's independence meetings, um, but I did very little work on it. It was not my purpose. So, in, just so I understand, in your role as strategic political and policy advisor to the First Minister, and this is around the same time that there's this movement towards yep. a second independence referendum, 
uh, your position is that you didn't actually do very much work on independence. I didn't. There was a delegated special advisor whose role was the constitution. He covered Brexit primarily and the development of the work on independence. I think it might be useful to say I had not been in government over that summer and um, I think that there's been a reference on material provided to me, a BBC article sort of headlining this independence issue on that date in September that you remembered or, or cited, um, which is again the publication of a programme for government. I had had no involvement in the writing of that programme for government, unusually. It was the first one in probably 10 years that I hadn't been part of. And it has maybe a page's worth of references to independence in a 180-odd page document. Um, it was a programme for government that set out, as we had in the election, a number of key policy objectives within government. And I had moved to lead on those policy objectives because I had a reflection, which the First Minister had shared, that you needed a special advisor who could work across portfolios with her confidence um, to try and inject some energy into them. Did the, the move towards pushing for a second independence uh, referendum, did that reflect a change of priority for Nicola Sturgeon away from the pandemic response and to the second independence referendum campaign in middle of 2021? Um, at that time, no, for her. Um, I mean, I wasn't there day to day, but my recollection of her in that time is that she remained um, incredibly focused on the COVID pandemic. Um, you can think about more than one thing at a time when you're First Minister, but she uh, devoted vast amounts of time to the COVID pandemic during this period still. Was she devoting vast amounts of time to the independent strategy around this time? Um, it was largely led by the Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution. I wanted to move on to um, another area, and this is around the public health messaging during the pandemic. You say in your first statement, and I don't intend to bring this up, that you have considerable experience in public communications. Is it fair to say that until at least March 2021, you played an important role in the Scottish Government's communication strategy in relation to the pandemic? Yes. And this included leading on, for instance, the um, preparations for the daily media briefings. Is that correct? Uh, I would share that responsibility with the head of the COVID briefing unit, but yes. And in fact, we've, we've seen some WhatsApp messages that you were actually one of the people that would decide, for instance, which advisor would appear to, on a, any given day. Is that, is that, it, does that accord with your recollection? Um, decide is, is possibly strong. I um, would suggest you would come on what day. They would tell me what days they were and were not available, and we'd work out how we were going to cover the whole week in coordination with the health communications desk. Were you the one effectively choosing, at least uh, before checking their availability, who would be the one that would front a particular media briefing? Um, I generally sought to simply just share it around and consider what each of them was working on and what we were likely to be speaking about. Um, so if we were going to be speaking about a you know, piece of Public Health Scotland work that had come out, I would probably look for D Professor Smith, Dr Smith, to do that. Um, if it was, we need to give people a general update on a reminder about behaviours, because the polling maybe shows that behaviours are slipping, I would look for Professor Leach to do that. So in broad terms, what was the Scottish Government's strategy um, around public health communications, at least until the period that you were in uh, it, position? It was to be um, honest, to be clear, um, to trust people, and to try and build cohesion amongst the public about the actions we were asking them to take. Um, there was a lot of focus on explaining to people why we were asking them to do certain things because that would boost the compliance, helping people understand the situation they were in and that we were in, um, and encouraging the behaviours that we needed people to uh, undertake in order to mitigate the spread of the virus. I think you said honest, to be honest with the people, to be clear, to trust the people and try and build cohesion amongst the public so that the public, you were able to explain to the public and the public understood why yeah. they were being asked to, um, to c comply with yeah. various measures. Is that correct? Yeah. And can you tell me the importance of um, honesty, trust, being clear and transparent with the public in terms of public health communication strategy? When... I think 
to ask people to do something as extreme as, you know, stay at home was something that was very unusual and unprecedented in people's lives. They had to have confidence that the people who were asking them to do that were asking them to do that for the right reasons. Um, and that it was something that we were asking of everyone. Um, and part of that was helping them to understand why it was necessary and the impact it was hoped that following that rule would have. Could there be sometimes good reasons uh, not to be open or candid or transparent with the public? Um, and if so, what sort of scenarios would there be where you wouldn't be open or transparent with the public? I think I can perhaps um, identify where you're taking me here. Um, there would be occasions around patient confidentiality, um, particularly early in the pandemic when uh, not at the time, but subsequent to, there have been arguments that people should have known more, that we should have said more to the public about certain events and certain cases. Um, that is an argument um, that has been made afterwards. And I think we can say very clearly, we, we told people about cases. We perhaps didn't tell everybody about the personal circumstances of individual cases. Um, so I think that that may be where you're heading. I think those are the main that is the main issue where you would keep something confidential is if there was harm that could be caused to an individual or to the process of managing COVID itself um, by making something more public. I think you probably were able to anticipate where I wanted to go. I wanted to ask you some questions about the Nike conference, yeah. which took place between the 25th and 27th of February 2020. Um, can we look at INQ 00022599? And what this is, is it's a chain of emails in which um, it's between yourself and Dr. Catherine Calderwoods, mm -hmm. and you'll see that other people copied in, include the First Minister's office uh, and indeed um, the Cabinet Secretary for Health. And if we look at um, what is being discussed here is whether to disclose the link between the conference mm -hmm. and the first outbreak of COVID-19 in Scotland. And if we see, this is an email from you saying, all CABSEC, FM and Gregor, can I just pause there, is that Sir Gregor Smith? Yes, it is. Who can discuss directly what we're looking for, are conscious that a number of Scotland's cases now connect to one event, and that we are at a point where that could be reassuring information for the public around the increase in numbers, demonstrate we're still at containment, that contact tracing works and be a legitimate public interest matter, Ahead of the updates um, to numbers at 2 p.m., can FM and CABSEC receive as full information as possible about that event, what's been done, the contact tracing, success, etc., and can consideration be given with comms as to what can be said around it? Um, so I asked you about uh, Professor Smith. Does this indicate that he was providing advice, information and advice on the Nike conference around this time? I think what happened, not specifically on the conference, um, I think the reason I'm referring to CAPSEC FM and Dr Smith at the same time is from my recollection, he had come from a meeting of SAGE to report to the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister what had been discussed and to update them. And so they were all in one room at this point. Um, at the same time, we were becoming aware that, I think it was the second case and then a couple of subsequent cases of COVID originated with a particular event. I can't say at the time that I knew it was a Nike conference until the following email. Um, and in a discussion with the three of them, we collectively thought, well, perhaps we should, if we tell people about this, it might reassure them that we don't have COVID bringing up in lots of different places, although perhaps in hindsight we did, but that these three or four cases, I think it was, are all from one event. So at least your email seems to suggest that you and potentially the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Jean Freeman, and perhaps even Professor Smith, were in favour of telling the public about the link between this one event and the number of Scotland's first known cases of COVID-19. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the Cabinet Secretary, the First Minister, and myself were, and Dr Smith was asked, you know, do you think we can, and had advised that yes, he thought we could, hence why I'm saying he can discuss directly what we're looking for. He had given us a bit of advice on verbally on, you know, there'll be limits, but yes. So he, he had given you advice saying that this can be, the link That's can my be recollection. disclosed to the public. Yeah. 
If we then turn um, to page one, which is a rep reply from Dr. Catherine Calderwood, and you'll see that this is on the 6th of March, and I wanted to look at the final to um, the end of that first page. Her response is, my strong advice would be not to say anything here specifically naming the conference risks breaching patient confidentiality, as a delegate list will be available. So you've, you've received some advice from um, Gregor Smith mm -hmm. saying that he thinks that this can be disclosed. And then the CMO at the time, Dr. Calderwood, says her strong advice is not to disclose. At the time, did you think Dr. Calderwood's advice about not saying anything was the correct position? Um, I suppose I didn't think it was necessarily for me to judge the correct position. I would still have favoured making information available. Um, but she was the doctor, she was the senior clinician, and she cited patient confidentiality. And ultimately, the First Minister accepted that advice. Would it not have been entirely possible to tell the public about what had happened without breaching patient confidentiality? That was, if you like, the purpose of my request in the, in the email to say, can, can we have some advice with comms about what can be said, I think is, is how it's framed, something like that. Um, was I was asking, what is the boundary of what we can say? What's the limit? Um, Dr Caldwood, I think, probably had a concern heightened because the first case of COVID in Scotland had, um, had media on their doorstep um, and had, you know, not in, been named as an individual, but it was quite well known who that person was. This was cases, you know, two and four and five, I think. So I think there was, her concern was that it is quite easy to find people in Scotland and she didn't want to open that prospect up. I, that's my speculation as to why she was so strong on the patient confidentiality issue here. Does this not give the impression of a cover-up because the link only becomes known to the public after a BBC disclosure documentary in May 2020, and that's when we're still in the first lockdown. Um, does this not impact the public's level of trust in the Scottish government's I mean, As I've said, my preference was to say that there were a number of cases connected to a conference. I don't think this uh, is as you've described it, because the cases themselves are publicly identified, like not identified as individuals, but the fact that there is an increase in COVID cases, that there have been four or five cases, is not kept within the government. That is published in the statistical update that went out every day. So that is known as are the health boards in which those individuals are located. Um, if uh, I think I understand why people think, you know, or we should have said this was a conference. I thought that at the time, but I can also see the view that Dr Calderwood had that actually you had people who were in quite a vulnerable position and you could be putting undue pressure on them at a time when they were unwell. My lady, I'm conscious of the time. Would this be a good <coughs> Certainly, time to break? Um, just I have one question on... I, I don't... I confess I don't quite understand Dr Calderwood's advice. Um, the delegate list would, what, be hundreds on it? Um, I can't recollect the size of the company. Chances are if it's an international company like Nike, it's going to be... I, I honestly can't. I think that is actually contained somewhere in this Freedom of Information request, but I can't recollect it. And I do understand what you say about easier to, to find people in Scotland. I, I just... I can't make the link between a delegate list being available and the patients being identified. But did you or the First Minister not challenge... That I can't remember. This would, is a question that you would need to put to the First Minister, that there may have been a, a conversation <laughs> after this advice. Um, but this was at a time when I think if, if you were told this was patient confidentiality, you didn't necessarily feel like you could challenge that. And, you know, the next day there were five, ten more cases and it quickly moved on. I think you could challenge it, but <laughs> there we go. Um, right, I shall return at... Um half past 11.
Mr Tarrick. Um, good morning again, my lady. Um, we had just finished um, speaking about the Nike conference. I now wanted to move on to um, INQ 00034641, which is again your notebook that we looked at in the morning session. Can we look at page 37? And you'll see that this is um, an entry that's undated, but if you see at the top, it says, not to be public, French national, other conditions, limited factual information. Do you see that? Yes. And there was an article in the Edinburgh Evening News suggesting that the first death from COVID-19 in Scotland was a Frenchman who had attended a rugby international. I think it was the Six Nations between Scotland and France on the 8th of March 2020. Why were details uh, not publicised at the time that the fact that this person had travelled from France to Edinburgh to watch the rugby? So... What was publicised at the time was that an individual had died and that they had another condition. This refers to advice. I can't remember who I was being given it from, but it's clearly a note of somebody telling me that we are not to release the fact that they were French. Again, I, this is not um, an issue about trying to uh, avoid disclosing the fact that they had been at the rugby. I think, from memory, um, though my recollection is not entirely clear, that this was either about family contact or an issue to do with the French consul and their sort of involvement in the fact that the person was French and needed repatriated. It was not um, anything to do with the fact that they had travelled from France to the rugby. It was some element of the procedure around the death. I think Dr Calderwood had said at the time that the patient was an older man who died under the care of NHS Lothian. Did that not give the impression to the public that the first person to die from COVID-19 in Scotland was a local person and not a Frenchman? It may have. And had the Scottish government told the public that the first person to die from COVID-19 in Scotland was a French national who had travelled from France to Edinburgh to watch the rugby, would this not have led to some uncomfortable questions for the Scottish government's role in allowing the match to proceed in the first place on the 8th of March 2020. It may have, but that was not the reason for not disclosing the fact that they were French, as far as I can recall. There was no um, discussion about, you know, did this or did this not relate to whether or not the rugby should have gone ahead. This was a, an issue about the patient, the person who had died. And as far as I can recall, either their family or the, the procedures around working with the French government. But telling the Scottish public that a French national had died would not breach patient confidentiality when there's potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of people travelling to the rugby from France, would it? Uh, it would not. And again, I would say I did not know the individual was connected to the rugby until shortly, a few days afterwards, from an external source. Also, if it was to do with contacting the family and the French consul, surely it would be not to be public until family informed or something of that kind, wouldn't it? It may have been, that may have just been shorthand, but the death was to be announced kind of straight away. Um, the French part was not to be public, certainly at that time. I, I can't recollect if there was a, you can say this afterwards. Um, but I did not know in this note that they were connected to the rugby. So the issue of but not revealing the rugby was not a concern that in my mind. That became known pretty soon to the Scottish government, didn't yes. it? And there was no... Um, decision made that we need to be honest, I think your words, honest, clear with the public, trust them and tell them that the first person that died from COVID-19 was in fact a French person who had entered Scotland to watch a rugby international that the Scottish government hadn't tried to stop. I think it became known to me, certainly, that they were from the rugby at the same point it became known to the public um, through other means. Um, I don't disagree with what you're saying. The circumstances at the time were that we were, a lot of the time you were simply just chasing your tail and you moved from one thing to the next very quickly. The um, moments of reflection that you're perhaps suggesting would have led us to say, oh, actually that death from two days ago, we can now confirm this, um, just didn't occur. Could another way of looking at it be that this is another example of a Scottish government trying to cover up what might be seen as uncomfortable information 
during the early months of the pandemic. That would be an inaccurate way of looking at it. The, before the break, I'd asked you about what good reasons could exist for not telling the public, not being honest with the public mm -hmm. um, about um, events happening during the pandemic. And I think you had said you'd identified patient confidentiality, which we've discussed. But you also said um, it, it might be that one can't tell the public because for the purpose of the process of managing COVID itself by making something more public. Can you explain what you meant by that? One of the issues around the Nike conference, and I think it was perhaps the, the subsequent line of Dr. Calderwood's email, and, and was the contact tracing. Um, and that you, or certainly clinicians, quite often at the very beginning, wanted this to conclude and to be done in a contained way rather than to create some sort of um, panic, if you like, around people who would not be contact traced because they hadn't, in their view, been exposed. But does that not contradict what you said earlier on about the values of public health communication, being clear with the public, being trusting the public? It is a, a balance. So you lean towards um, always putting the information in the public domain. Um, there has to be a reason to not put the information in the public domain, and that reason has to be, you know, clinical, scientific, you know, proven to be worth it. Um, but these are, you know, a very small number of examples, and I can think of no others, to be honest, where information about COVID cases that we had, um, particularly in the early days, you, once you got to larger numbers, the, the detailed information was not something that you know, we had, unless there were specific outbreaks, um, was not put in the public domain. Does this not suggest that there wasn't really a kind of concrete strategy, that we have to be honest, candid with the public, transparent at all times, but it was just a matter of discretion, whether the Scottish Government felt perhaps this is a matter that we should not disclose, and uh, this is no. a matter that we no. should? Um, the principle was that you were honest and transparent and put as much information as the, in the public domain as you could. Um, my understanding, and I'm not the doctor here, my understanding of patient confidentiality is that is an obligation on clinicians. So when they say that they don't want you to release something under patient confidentiality, um, you, I appreciate you said earlier, Milady, that you could push back. You do feel obliged to take account of that. And I wanted to move on to a different topic and that's the use and retention of informal communications relating to the pandemic. These being, for example, relevant WhatsApp messages. And I think it's important I place some context to my questions. You voluntarily provided the first batch of your WhatsApp messages with Nicola Sturgeon, along with the first draft of your statement in July 2023. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. And these were messages between yourself and Nicola Sturgeon dated between the 1st of September 2020 and the 16th of March 2021. That's correct. So a period of about six and a half months. We've already looked at some of those messages this morning, and those were the first messages that had been provided by anyone involved in the Scottish Government's response to the pandemic to this inquiry. Then in November 2023, there was a further, in response to a further request by the inquiry, you provided a page of additional messages between you and the First Minister. Mm -hmm. And these were messages dated over one day, this being the 31st of August 2020 to the 1st of September 2020. And at the same time, you provided some additional messages between yourself and Jean Freeman, Kate Forbes and Shirley Ann Somerville. And these messages were provided after the inquiry had raised publicly concerns at the preliminary mm -hmm. hearing about the disclosure of informal communications uh, from the Scottish Government. And at that stage, when those concerns were raised publicly, you were still the only person who had provided any WhatsApp mes messages from the Scottish Government to this module. Then in response to um, a f another request to Nicola Sturgeon for her messages relating to the pandemic response, she provided in November 2023 copies of the same first batch of messages that you had provided to the inquiry in July 2023. And I think she had said that those messages were not retained on her phone, but she held copies. Did you 
discuss with Nicola Sturgeon that you were going to voluntarily disclose some of the WhatsApp messages between you and her um, to the inquiry? And if so, what was discussed? I told her that I... So I received the inquiry's request. Um, I told her that I had messages, that I was submitting them to the inquiry. When I submitted them to the inquiry, I also submitted them to the government and asked the government to pass them to the former First Minister. I asked the government to do the same with the messages I submitted from Ms Freeman, Ms Somerville, Ms Forbes. Were you aware at that stage that she had deleted all of her messages from her phone when you submitted your messages to the inquiry and then passed them to the Scottish government for her? Uh, yes, I, I think I had become aware at that point that she didn't have the messages anymore. And are you aware of how then Nicola Sturgeon came into possession of those messages? Was it through the Scottish Government? Yes, I asked the Scottish Government to pass the messages to Ms Sturgeon. Why is it that you retained these messages, but she has not? Um, I can't speak for her. I'm not going to speculate on uh, the reasons here, with the one exception of saying that in this conversation between us, I am the official, and she she can answer if this is the case, she may have had reason to think, well, Liz has them. Um, that's the official part taken care of because I am the official in that exchange. Um, I, uh, to be clear, all the sort of relevant salient COVID management stuff in those emails is in the system in government, in sorry, WhatsApps, in other forms. Um, I retain messages for my reference uh, initially, you know, it's good to be able to look back, similar to my notebook. You know, I can go back and check have things happened as and when they are supposed to have happened. Um, I then thought I should keep them because of the nature of this inquiry. So, just so I'm clear, we've looked at some of these messages, and I think we've agreed, tell me if I'm incorrect, that we've agreed that they place important context in some of the decisions that were being made. Do you accept that? I do. And those messages would be important to understand the how, the whys, the whens, the wheres of how the Scottish Government came to make certain decisions during the pandemic. Do you accept that? Um, I think they are important, but I think the, the how, why, where decisions are made is contained in the official record, or it certainly should be. <laughs> but they're important context. Yes. And they're part of the decision-making process. They might, they might not be the only part of the decision-making process, but they're part of that process. Um, Do you accept that? Yes, to an extent, yes. And you were her chief of staff yes. during up till March 2021. Uh, was it your understanding of the Scottish Government policies that these sorts of messages showing the decision-making should be retained? Um, I think I, in the second submission to the inquiry, have set out my knowledge of Scottish Government policies in this regard. Um, in relation to records management policy, and I'm going to have to talk about the two policies to give the full context here. In relation to the rec records management policy, it has always been my understanding of the need, whatever form the communication takes, to put um, salient material into the official records. It, it's useless on my phone. It, it achieves nothing sitting on my phone. It needs to be somewhere in the government system to have any form of effect or to inform government's broader thinking. Um, I, to the best of my recollection, was not familiar with the mobile messaging policy. Do you know, as Nicola Sturgeon's Chief of Staff, whether she was familiar with the mobile messaging policy? I couldn't policy? speak to that. And so you weren't aware of the policy that others have told me about, where they claim the policy was to delete a bedtime ritual? Um, I have no recollection. I can't be categoric because a lot of things in government would pass through my inbox, but I have no recollection of specifically reading that policy at any point in time. Um, private secretaries would, you know, occasionally remind you to, you know, manage your inboxes, manage your email. Mine frequently breached the government limits. So, you know, there would be a need to um, make sure you were keeping the right stuff, get rid of extraneous material, not relevant material. But no, I, I have no recollection of having um, seen that policy. I can't say 100% that I didn't. But Even if you no. had seen it, would you have deleted matters that might have been subject to an FOI request? Uh, no, I don't think I would. No. Or certainly not intentionally. And I think you've said that it was your practice that you, the salient, perhaps, messages would be recorded mm -hmm. onto the corporate record. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. 
So some of the WhatsApp messages that we've seen, which show some of the context or some of the decision-making process, was it your habit to then record those messages into an email so it could be uploaded onto the corporate record? Um, yes, largely. It would not... And I think I said this out my own. It's not that I would write an email saying I have had a WhatsApp exchange with Nicola Sturgeon and it might be I have been in discussion with or I've, you know, had an exchange with. It's reflective of the way in which I would have handled a conversation um, in the, co the pre-COVID world and actually during COVID where we were in the same place is you have a conversation or an exchange of discussion information with the First Minister and for that to be useful to anyone, including me, it has to go into the system somehow. It has to be communicated to an official, to her private office. I might ask her private office to put it in. Um, I might email an official. Some of this might have been... So if we go back to the weddings example, I think I would have been on Teams to the relevant official saying, FM's asking me this question. Can you provide me with information? Um, I think you can see from the exchanges that they are very much about immediate issues. You know, they tend to be about things that are happening that day, the next day, and are about coordinating some of those things. And so me simply knowing that does not facilitate the business of government. It needs to enter the record to facilitate the business but of government. But using that example of the number of people that can attend mm -hmm. funerals or weddings, so is it, would it have been your practice that you would have recorded that there had been potentially a decision or a view reached that the number should remain at 20 in a formal email or an email or some other form of written communication to somebody else? On that specific one, there is, I would expect, some form of written communication between me and an official checking the facts, saying FM's asking if there had then been a push for you know, I want more, she wants more information or she wants to question this, that would have had to have gone again into the formal record to say, can the First Minister get fresh briefing on this point or can you ask the CMO to consider this point for the First Minister? Um, so it may not have been in that case that I provided, you know, I provide the First Minister with information and she doesn't ultimately respond to the point um, that I said, well, I gave her this information and there's nothing back, so let's stick with it. But I would certainly have said, she's asked me for this. So there is no awareness that the First Minister is asking a question about this. And I know in that exchange, I then say the note from the Prime Minister is coming to her, you know, the Prime Minister's statement is coming to her. So I would expect it to be in an exchange of, do we know what they're doing? Can we have it? Get but I lost there? the context of that decision, and whether it's a decision, a positive decision, or one not to change the restrictions would be was within the WhatsApp messages. And if I understand your practice correct, that context would not be uploaded onto the corporate record. No, I think that context would have been there because it would have been the engagement with the official and the subsequent note going to the First Minister about the Prime Minister's statement would have been in the context of the Prime Minister is making a statement today. The UK are doing this. The FM is asking this, etc. That would, I expect, all be clear in whether it was an email exchange or a Teams exchange, that would, I expect, all be clear. But not the communications between those two events that would place context on how, ultimately, I think the Scottish government came to a decision not to change the numbers. I think if you're asking, did I, you know, transcribe verbatim? No. I treat those messages in the same way that I would have treated a conversation with the First Minister and input the material parts of the discussion to the system in order that they could facilitate the business of government or, you know, be recorded in some way. I now wanted to move on to a related matter. In your first statement, you said, and I'll quote this, I won't bring the statement up, I have indicated to the Scottish Government that I expect all messages to be submitted. Why did you feel the need to tell the inquiry that you had indicated to the Scottish Government that your expectation was that all of your messages would be disclosed to the inquiry? I think the timing of this correlates to a UK government um, case about whether they had to provide uh, messages that were not COVID related about who got to do the, you know, redacting, if you like. And the Scottish government had said to me that I could wait for the conclusion of that um, before deciding whether to give you everything or to who was going to do the redactions. And my view was just give them it. The messages that you have produced between yourself and Nicola Sturgeon cover, as I said, a six and a half month period. Mm -hmm. And that's between the 1st of September 2020 and the 16th of March 2021. 
and then there's the later additional messages spanning one day. Um, is, is it fair to assume that you were in WhatsApp communication with Nicola Sturgeon about the pandemic um, before the 1st of September 2020? Um, yes, it would be. I think at a lesser extent. And for the record, I would like to say that I regret not being able to give the inquiry those messages. I thought I had them. I have sourced them. I have done everything that I am able to do as far as I can to find them. I thought I had retained them and they're not there. Why do you say that you would be in communication with the First Minister before the 1st of September 2020 over WhatsApp to a lesser extent? <laughs> We when were, we would be going through the first lockdown, for um, instance. Because we were in the same place more than we were at a later date. So I think I attended St Andrew's House the vast majority of days, including Saturdays and Sundays. Every day there would have been a briefing. I would have been there from early in the morning until late at night, and so would she. So during that very intense period, the majority of the discussion that she and I would have about thrashing out what we were going to do would have been happening in person. But there would be some messages. I think a lot of them would have been logistical around the briefings, who was going to be there, the BBC are offering you an address to the nation, that kind of thing, if I had been in a different room, for example. But there would also be, for instance, um, you weren't working with her through every night, that there would be, you would go both go home, there would be messages that would continue, the conversations would continue sometimes, over on WhatsApp. In fact, we've seen many of your messages that are late into the night. Um, and those would be messages, for instance, around March 2020 that would shed perhaps some light on decision making around the first lockdown. I genuinely do not think there would be much of significance around early March 2020 in the WhatsApp messages between us um, and around the decision making on lockdown because those discussions and decisions, and I remember them very clearly, um, happened in St Andrew's House, normally with Dr Calderwood, Jean Freeman. Um, and if you like, at that point, you know, um, yes, we, we did go home, um, but I think there was very little time left in the day by the time I was going home in those occasions. What happened to those messages that you're not able to provide to the inquiry? Um, as I've said, I, I genuinely don't know, and I regret that I thought I had them. Um, I'm not the best administrator of uh, devices. Um, I wish I did have them, and I can't say what happened to them. They're not there. I can't say whether I actively deleted them. I can't say whether they got lost. I don't know. What efforts have you made to retrieve those messages? Um, I have used that phone, the phone I have now. There are two previous phones with that number. I have sort of revived them and searched on them. I have used every online tool that tells me how to extract information from WhatsApp that may be there. I can't get to them. And, and as I've said in my evidence, I haven't gone to the lengths of handing them to somebody to forensically source, but I'm content to do that if the inquiry wants me to. Were those messages held on a personal device by you, a personal mobile yes. phone? Did Nicola Sturgeon also use a personal mobile phone to communicate with you? Um, I, I believe so, but I'm not aware of the sort of details of what phone she had and what from, um, who you, provided it. You were her chief of staff, weren't you, for her about phone, six years? Her phone would be a matter for her private office, not for me. Did she have a government-issued phone? Again, I think she only had one. And who provided that phone is not something I can answer. If she had one phone, and we hear evidence that it was a personal phone and that she never had a government-issued phone, did she use that one phone to conduct government business with you? Evidently, we had discussions about government business on the phone that she had. As her chief of staff, did you ever advise her that it might be a good idea to use a government-issued phone to conduct government business? Um, I don't know that I did. Um, I am aware that on ministers' personal phones, the government installs a sort of secure app. Um, so I would be less concerned with the device and more concerned with the security. Did Nicola Sturgeon also use an SNP email account for a government business? Not really, no. Um, 
I'm aware of the exchange with Dr. Shridhar, Professor Shridhar, the other day. Um, I do know that those exchanges entered into her formal account. So people can send... What people externally send you something on is for them rather than you, if you like. The obligation on you as a, a government member or a, a civil servant is to then put that into the system. But if you're openly... Did, or did she openly volunteer her SNP email accounts to others to use? For, to you would need her? to ask the first minister, former first minister, these questions. There was one further question I wanted to ask um, before uh, I believe that there is a lie, there is a question from one of the core participants, and this was around the uh, the question is around um, advisors straying into perhaps political space. And there, there was a few instances, for instance, um, during the pandemic. I think at one stage, Jason Leach got into a Twitter exchange with Richard Leonard, who was part of, I think, he was a leader of Scottish Labour at the time. And I think we've seen WhatsApp messages where I think there is reference to you and Nicola Sturgeon speaking to Jason Leach and telling him to stay out of the political space. Do you recollect that? I do. It's in, I think, the exchanges with Freeman. And there's also, um, there was instances where I think Professor Sridhar spoke about independence and how independence would have led to the Scottish government being able to better address the pandemic response. Do you remember those sorts of press articles? I do. And occasionally I think there was some pushback from opposition parties about the fact that an independent advisor to the Scottish mm -hmm. government was straying into constitutional arguments. Was the distinction between politics and medical or scientific or clinical advice always clear to the Scottish government's advisors? I think it was. So just I had no conversation with Professor Shruda about her articles or, or any of her contributions. Um, I think it is clear. I think it was clear. I think Professor Leach and Dr Smith, um, they took on a communications duty that they were not used to. Um, and they made themselves incredibly available to all forms of media. And again, they weren't used to that. And I think their, if you like, enthusiasm to try and give the public answers um, sometimes led to them accidentally overstepping a line that they would not be as well versed as, as I might be in seeing. Um, so I would occasionally have conversations with Professor Leach, for example, if there was a political issue running in the day and he was going on the radio to say, if they raise this, you have nothing to say. This is not a matter for you. And you refer them back to the government or to a politician or to me. Um, and he would sometimes ask ahead of things if he knew that something was running today that was political, how do I get away from this subject? <laughs> because this is not one that I should speak to. But occasionally, and I think this is clear from the messages from Ms Freeman, they um, succumbed to the pressure, I think, of being asked questions and feeling that they had an obligation to answer because they were out there to try and inform the public. And that would create issues of potential issues around trust of Scottish government communications if some of the messaging coming from scientific advisors or medical advisors or clinical advisors was seen to be whether it's party, political, it was perceived to be that way. That would is create issues of trust, wouldn't it? Um, I have, I think, more faith in the Scottish public than some people do, that they are able to differentiate what is political from what is medical and clinical. Um, and they watched a lot of information during that time. They watched these people give public statements a lot during that time. And I think, I think the public knew. I don't think those instances had particular impact on trust. My lady, uh, there's no, no <coughs> further questions from me. I just believe... before Ms Mitchell um, asks a question, um, I, I, can I just go back to, I'm afraid I don't have the inquiry number for the document, um, the Cabinet meeting of the 30th of June 2020, mm -hmm. where there was a reference, and I appreciate you weren't part of the conclusion, you were there taking notes, observing, advising, whatever. But um, there are some people who might see the conclusion agreed that consideration should be given to restarting work on independence and referendum, reflecting the experience of the coronavirus and EU exit. Mm -hmm. Oh, well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, I can't remember what page it is. 13, 13. I think. Oh. It's, 
Well done to you too. Sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Always accept help. Thank you. Um, some people might argue that, that looks as if the cabinet members who agreed to that conclusion were going to use the work on um, the experience of the coronavirus crisis as part of an argument for advancing independence and therefore using it politically. If you, when you see it's associated with EU <laughs> exit, which obviously a lot of people in Scotland who didn't want to leave the European Union set, re reckon reflects badly on the UK government, it does look a bit as if yeah, I mean, politicisation of the coronavirus pandemic. I think the fact that this says consideration should be given, my recollection, my view, my understanding, my experience of all of this period is that uh, the consideration given was we're not doing this right now. Um, there is subsequently, much after this, you know, there has been a lot said and reflected on about the way in which people in Scotland looked to the Scottish Government to provide the leadership in the COVID pandemic and what they then felt about the constitutional situation. But our actions were not designed to produce that result. If the public were making their own decisions on that, we were not driving it through our actions on the pandemic. It's not the point of my question, really, oh, which is that, well, no, I, I understand why you answered in the way you did, but my question is, doesn't it look as if at least some members of the Cabinet, and the, eventually the Cabinet agreed, um, to capitalise on the pandemic to advance the cause of independence? Doesn't that look... So, as I say, the consideration given to this was this was not done at this time. No, but I think look if you it, take yeah. the um, discussion that we had earlier about the difficulties of funding and financing the mitigations required for applying public health interventions, uh, that was at times not in our presentation of it at that time, but it did show and arguments could be made at a later date that there was a hampering that would not have been there had we been independent. Um, but I would be at length to say to you that this was not done at this point in time. Um, I have no recollection, no notes, no work. If anything had been done in this period, it would be publicly available. There would be you know, reams of evidence of the Scottish Government going out and selling independence during this period, and there just isn't. Thank you. Ms Mitchell. I'm obliged. Ms Lloyd, I appear as instructed by Amar Anor and Company on behalf of the Scottish Covid Bereaved. I'm obliged to my learned friend um, for his questioning, which raises a lot of issues um, the Scottish Covid Bereaved are interested in. But I would just like to ask you one thing, and it relates to paragraph 42 of your statement. I don't need that brought up, um, but I'll just read it out so you, you can uh, understand the question that I'm asking. You say, communication within Scottish Government and with stakeholders, while strong and effective under considerable pressure, could at times have been improved, particularly around the application of the framework and the application or the lifting of restrictions. Teams within Scottish Government did not always appear to be hearing each other, particularly on the interaction between economic and COVID harms. And economic teams did not seem equipped or prepared to explain to stakeholders why certain restrictions were in place and why decisions were taken not to lift them. Mm -hmm. Now, can I ask you to expand upon that in particular? Why, why do you think that was? And my second question is, if that being so, what could be put in place to improve it? Um, when your role, I think, as a civil servant, as a policy official, is to engage with stakeholders, it often becomes your job to, to listen to them rather than to make arguments back as to why the government is doing a particular thing. I think um, that's something I've experienced in the Scottish government frequently. And the economic officials I found in particular, and, and they worked incredibly hard, I don't want to cast any sort of aspersions on them. They, when they were engaging with economic stakeholders, I felt and had reports back from some of the calls that they would not explain why certain things were happening. They would listen to why stakeholders perhaps didn't want certain things to happening, but they would not make the argument for. Um, and I know that the clinicians who were often on these calls felt that they were sort of left to be the bad guys, if you like, explaining why we cannot open your pub this week or we cannot allow shops to open just yet and, and the balance of the virus. Um, in that particular case, I think this was, this was a very difficult situation because 
you were taking actions to save people's lives, but they impacted people's livelihoods. And, you know, you have to acknowledge that, that was a very difficult balance to strike. Um, I, I'm not sure what can be put in place to deal with it. I think there are broader reflections on the government's engagement with economic stakeholders, which I think the relationship was not great going into it, so it deteriorated during it. Um, but I'm not sure you can put that in place other than uh, a sort of building the confidence of the officials that you are asking to um, explain the situation in the information that you're asking them to explain. The reluctance of those people whose job it was to explain that and sort of pass that over onto those who were um, the scientists, as mm -hmm. it were, it, it, is that a reflection of their anxiety about the information or just an unwillingness to be the ones who are breaking the bad news? I think it's sort of the reflection of the pressure you can feel in government when a group of people are telling you that they disagree strongly with the actions that you're taking. Um, to be the one that has to then stand up for those actions, explain them, defend them, um, that can, I expect, and I think I understand this, feel like quite a burden on, on somebody. If you are in a, a call and there are 15 people telling you they're wrong, that you are wrong, um, they may be right, and you have a duty to listen to them and to feed that back. Indeed, but... But if you've been given information to put out there, it's your duty to put that out there. And I think people tended to step back a little bit when confronted with arguments against the actions we were taking. Indeed, one would think it would be an important part of the communication between government and stakeholders that they listened to what they were saying. And if there was a good argument, which no doubt the Scottish government would contend that their argument was good, to give that to them. So even if they didn't accept what it was, they understood. And what you were saying mm -hmm. was that was lacking within the, the minister's I'm not saying they ability. didn't do it. Um, I'm not always convinced it was done with a level of detail, understanding, explanation that was helpful. It didn't help bring people to a better understanding of what was happening. My lady. Thank you, Ms Mitchell. Just before you go, Ms Lloyd, may I um, ask you to help me on another matter in relation to M2? Um, as you may have followed, um, I heard a certain amount of evidence about the role of special advisers in Number 10 um, and the role of Mr Dominic Cummings as an example. You talked about the, um, there's a special advisor's code mm -hmm. that applied to, I mean, I think technically what happens is that they are, that the special advisors as you were and Dominic Cummings was, are technically part of the civil service, but they don't answer to any of the, as it were, the governance or management mm -hmm. structure of the civil service. They answer to the minister or the first minister or the prime minister. Yeah. And I just find that a bit troubling. I mean, don't you end up with a conflict then between... I think it's how you do it. I don't think I ended up with a conflict. Um, the Special Advisor Code and sits alongside the Civil Service Code. You are governed by both with an exemption from certain parts of the Civil Service Code that enables your political activities. And you are appointed by the First Minister. Um, I think if you are conscious that the civil servants around you have to comply with the Civil Service Code and they have obligations on them then a conflict doesn't arise. And whilst the First Minister is, if you like, my um, line manager, the person that appointed me, the person that could fire me, um, I was cognizant of the senior officials in the Scottish Government and my relationship with them. So as much as I was sort of um, on a par, if you like, I knew that you know I needed to be aware if they were unhappy, perhaps thought a special advisor was stepping over the line, that is a back and forth relationship. That's a relationship that exists because you build that relationship. Um, but I don't think I found a conflict um, and I don't think such a conflict existed in the Scottish Government. So it's not a question of improving structures or anything you think is a personality matter? Um, I, I, my views on the operation number 10 are, are available in my notebooks. Um, I don't think I should particularly comment on the relationship between Dominic Cummings. I've probably pressed you too far. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Ms Lloyd. Very grateful for your help. Right. Um, I think the next witness is the First Minister, who yes. has other demands on his time. Um, and I think the hope is that he will be here by about 1, 1.15, so we're going to have to take the usual... 1.45. 1.45 start.
obliged. So everyone has a slightly longer lunch. Thank you.
Mr Dawson. Good afternoon, my lady. The next witness is the Right Honourable Hamza Yusuf, MSP. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. So, I appreciate the other demands on your time, obviously, and I can guarantee you that uh, everyone's under strict instructions will finish by 4:30 at the latest. Thank you, my lady. Uh, you are Hamza Yusuf. That is right. You have helpfully provided two statements to the inquiry. If we could just look at these. Uh, first is INQ 00-273956. It's a statement dated the 2nd of November 2023. Is that your statement? That is. Have you signed the statement? I have. Can you confirm to her ladyship that the contents of the statement remain true and accurate as at today's date? I can confirm. That is the case. You provided a second statement, I understand, dated the 16th of November 2023. Is that correct? That is correct. It's under reference INQ 00273973. Is that your statement? That is. Have you signed the statement? I have. Do the contents of that statement remain true and accurate as at today's date? They do. Thank you. Uh, you are the current First Minister of Scotland. That's correct. Uh, you explain in your statement that you are responsible for leading the Scottish Government with the support of Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers. Is that correct? That is correct. You became First Minister on the 29th of March 2023, taking over the role from former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, during the course of the pandemic, uh, you held two Cabinet Secretary roles, as I understand it. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, the first role was Cabinet Secret Secretary for Justice, which you held from the 26th of June 2018 to the 19th of May 2021. That is correct. And the second, uh, following the Scottish parliamentary election in May 2021, you took over the health and social care portfolio. You took that over from uh, Ms Jean Freeman, who had held the role during the earlier stages of the pandemic. Is that correct? That is correct. And you held that portfolio until you became First Minister on the 28th of March 2023. Absolutely correct. Could I just clarify that um, when Ms Freeman held the role prior to the election, I understand the role was entitled Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, but when you held it Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, is that correct? That is correct. Is there any uh, significance in the change of name with regard to the portfolios that you covered in your ministerial Cabinet Secretary role? Uh, no, I don't think there would have been uh, much of a, a change, uh, although uh, having taken sport uh, out of the title and replaced it with social care, uh, I did have a minister that took on the title of sport in her title. Uh, but uh, ultimately, as the Cabinet Secretary, I would have been responsible for the entirety of the portfolio. So you and she were both responsible for health, including public health? That's correct. And you and she were both responsible for social care? That's correct. Thank you. I'd like to ask you some questions about some of the decision-making structures which existed uh, within the Scottish Government during the course of the pandemic. Uh, some of these are things we've heard about, but we think you might have some insights into uh, how they operated. Um, we've heard some talk, and you mentioned in your statement, uh, of a group or decision-making body called Gold or Gold Command. Um, you're, are you aware of what that group uh, did? I am. Uh, I understand that you attended that group, not always, but sometimes. Correct. Am I correct in understanding this was a selected group of cabinet ministers, which would tend to include, oh, it would always include Ms Sturgeon, uh, and sometimes include others, including Mr Swinney, yourself, Ms Forbes, at various different times? Uh, absolutely correct. Thank you. Could I have a look, please, at paragraph 35 of your statement, where you provide us a little more detail about this? Um, you say at paragraph 35 that in relation to how decision-making could have been improved during the pandemic, I believe there were times when a decision made by the former First Minister or discussed within Gold Command was not cascaded to the rest of Cabinet or all Ministers due to the fast nature of decision-making during the pandemic. We did our best to explain the rationale of decision-making, but the feedback from some groups, in particular the hospitality industry, was that the rules were changing too often, with decisions made before guidance was available. On reflection, there may have been instances where we could have worked with industry on guidance before making a final decision on restrictions. I believe this could have been improved. In relation to advisory stru structures, my experience is that the advice was always ready and available when needed. Um, 
What do you mean when you suggest that decisions were made by the former First Minister uh, which were not cascaded to the rest of Cabinet? Uh, with my lady's permission before I answer the substance uh, of that question, I just wonder if I can uh, begin uh, before I respond to the first substantial question by acknowledging uh, the trauma and the grief uh, that so many families and individuals faced and continue to face during the course of the pandemic, particularly those who have been bereaved uh, by COVID. I want to offer my condolences uh, once again to every single person who has been bereaved by COVID. However, let me also acknowledge it is not sympathies uh, that they uh, require from witnesses, but straight answers to straight questions, uh, which, of course, I endeavour to give over the course of the next uh, few hours. In relation to the substance of the question uh, that you have asked, uh, Mr Dawson, uh, for me, uh, given the fast-paced nature of what we were dealing with, therefore the need for urgent decisions uh, to be made, uh, decisions were sometimes delegated to the former uh, First Minister. Uh, Cabinet would uh, agree to that, um, and the former First Minister was then entrusted to make those decisions. And there, were, there was the rare occasions <coughs> where sometimes a decision uh, was uh, made, again, responding to a particular development, uh, and uh, it was uh, therefore uh, not cascaded to the rest uh, of Cabinet uh, until uh, that decision uh, was uh, announced, and that uh, happened on the rare occasion. Um, but uh, we, we were often, I know, special advisers, uh, I know government officials worked hard to ensure uh, that Cabinet was informed uh, of decisions uh, when they were made, uh, as opposed to <coughs> even, uh, once they were announced. So I think you've identified there situations in which decisions were made by the First Minister, the former First Minister, uh, based on a delegated authority from Cabinet. That's one type of decision-making process. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And there were other times when, I think you characterised them as being, uh, because of the pressures of the pandemic, decisions were taken by the First Minister where there had not been that delegation, but that that process was necessary because a decision needed to be made immediately. Is that right? That would be correct. Um, so therefore, it is the case, I think, that you're saying that some decisions were made uh, in those circumstances which did not have the approval of the Cabinet. So uh, again, there would have been some decisions that may have been made uh, in that way. And for the most part, Cabinet would agree decisions that were, had to be made. Uh, there may well be times uh, when the exact uh, detail of a decision, so for example, if we were to, uh, if Cabinet agreed to impose restrictions around household numbers mixing indoors, there may, be, may not be a final decision on the number of households or the number of people from a certain number of households. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, we would seek to delegate that decision to the First Minister, to the Deputy First Minister, Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health uh, to make. And that may well be because the decision was going to be announced in a couple or a few days' time. Uh, and of course, the situation could develop in terms of the epidemiology of the virus. Uh, and uh, factors such as, as, as the R number. Uh, so we would, uh, there would be times uh, when we would entrust uh, the former First Minister to make that decision on delegated authority. It would be uh, unusual, rare, very rare, uh, I think, for uh, the former First Minister uh, to make a decision uh, without uh, either that delegated authority or without informing Cabinet that decision was made before it was announced. Were decisions made in Cabinet or were they made by the First Minister and or within this gold command structure? Uh, a variety of all of those. And decisions were uh, made at Cabinet. And of course, uh, the inquiry has uh, a, a number of uh, documents in relation to Cabinet uh, minutes and, and, and meetings. So discussions uh, were engaging in Cabinet. There were sometimes differences of opinion, as you can uh, well uh, imagine. Um, but decisions were made uh, often uh, at Cabinet. Gold Command, though, was there for a reason, because the situation could, of course, change between one week's Cabinet meeting uh, and the next, given the fast-paced nature of the, uh, of the uh, virus that we were dealing with. Uh, so Gold Command was an important structure, and ultimately also the First Minister, we knew, was, of course, dealing, uh, doing daily briefings uh, virtually uh, every uh, single day. Uh, and therefore, there was also that delegated authority, should she have to make a decision um, because of a, a, a development in the virus that particular day. So I think it is, uh, to answer your question, uh, a mixture of all of those. We've heard evidence about the constitutional structure 
uh, within which the Scottish Government purports to operate from a political expert, Professor Paul Kearney. Um, he confirmed that the basic structure is that decisions are to be make, made in Cabinet, uh, as is the case within the UK Government, uh, and that there are good constitutional reasons for that. Um, do you accept that, as a matter of principle, is the way in which decisions are meant to be made within our constitutional system? Yes, I, I agree that uh, absolutely that Cabinet is an important structure for decision-making. Because within Cabinet, there are a number of voices that are able to approach important questions from a number of perspectives. And if there is real discussion and debate uh, within that forum, those perspectives can all be given uh, the respect that they deserve, such that better decisions can be made. Would that be a fair summary of why the system is as it is? That is uh, a fair summary. And as somebody who has had a number of cabinet secretary positions in the past and is now in the very privileged position of being First Minister, uh, there is very good reason uh, for decisions being made at Cabinet, uh, and that is how decisions are made on most occasions, particularly during normal times. We were not, of course, in normal times in the course of the pandemic, uh, and therefore uh, there will often be more delegated decisions uh, made during the pandemic than you would make in, in normal times. But I, I, I as First Minister, also uh, will ask Cabinet uh, for delegated authority on decision-making, most recently done in the course of the, of the budget uh, last year, where I asked the Cabinet uh, to delegate final decision-making to myself and the Finance Secretary, um, and, and Cabinet uh, approved uh, that. But to be clear, you've told us that there were occasions on which the First Minister, either with or without the benefit of discussions within Gold Command, took decisions without the delegated authority of the Cabinet? Again, I think those times would be uh, very rare, uh, very rare occasions. Often uh, the former First Minister would seek uh, Cabinet's uh, delegated authority, but I think there was an understanding in exceptional cases where the epidemiology of the virus uh, had changed, if there had been a a, a sudden spike in cases in 24 hours uh, and therefore a decision had to be made there and then that uh, there was an understanding that given that this was not normal times that such decisions uh, could be uh, made by the First Minister. You suggested, I think, in your evidence that there was a certain regularity uh, with which Cabinet met. Was it not possible to convene Cabinet meetings at short notice in those urgent situations? Of course, it could. Gold Command, in essence, was, was a, a tighter cast list of... Uh, cabinet secretaries that were necessary to make a particular decision. Uh, Gold Command uh, and the attendance of Gold Command, of course, would change depending on the decision that was required to be made. I attended some Gold Command meetings in my various cabinet secretary roles and in others I did not because uh, it just depended on the decision that was required uh, to be made. Cabinet minutes are a record of discussions taken at cabinet meetings and they are published, are they not? That is correct. Discussions within Gold Command were not generally minuted and published. Is that correct? And my understanding was that Gold uh, Command meetings uh, should have been uh, minuted, um, but uh, uh, if that was not the case, uh, then that would not have been a usual protocol for government meetings. They should be minuted uh, and, uh, of course, uh, be available uh, should there be the appropriate request. If an interested citizen of Scotland wished to know what discussions had taken place within Gold Command that had led to significant decisions which impacted upon people's most fundamental freedoms, such a citizen would be generally entitled to be able to see how those decisions had been made. Would you agree? Yes. If it transpires to be the case that Gold Command meetings were not minuted, it would be difficult for such a citizen to access that information, wouldn't it? It would be difficult, but of course there could also be uh, requests for information of discussions at Cabinet, uh, or indeed, uh, of course, any other documentation that might be necessary uh, and might have been uh, relevant to any decision uh, that was made. Was, was the Scottish Cabinet during the pandemic a decision-ratifying body rather than the main decision-making body? No, I, I wouldn't agree with that characterisation. For my attendance at Cabinet meetings, there was good, engaging conversation. As I said, at times, disagreement on the approach uh, that was to be taken. Um, but our Cabinet uh, uh, meetings were a, were a good discursive uh, fora by which to have those um, discussions. We went there simply to, to ratify 
Uh, as I say, I can think of uh, instances where challenge was brought forward and what was in the original submission or advice from officials was therefore uh, amended uh, accordingly, depending on the decision that was then taken. Was it the former First Minister's practice to take important decisions as a result of discussions with a close group of ministerial and other colleagues, whether in gold command or not, not calling upon Cabinet or the wide, wider advisory structures available to the Scottish Government? Again, uh, it will be for the former First Minister, of course, to uh, answer exactly uh, how she would make decisions. But in my experience as Cabinet Secretary, who served under her in a variety of roles, um, she uh, found great value in the discursive uh, nature of Cabinet, of Gold Command, uh, but also equally, uh, if Cabinet as a whole did not have to be uh, brought together, uh, given the very precise nature of a decision that had to be made, then Gold Command was, the, I think, the appropriate fora by which to make that decision. Could I have you... You, you provided um, to the inquiry a number of WhatsApp exchanges in which you were involved from the period of the pandemic, as requested by the inquiry. Is that not correct? Yeah, that is correct. Thank you. Um, could we have a look, please, at INQ 00033792? This is um, a record of some WhatsApp exchanges between yourself and Professor Jason Leach, who is the National Clinical Director. Is that correct? That is correct. In fact, I think this comes from the very day on which you were appointed as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care. Is that right? I think that is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's some discussion here, um, which we'll, we'll get on to in a little bit more detail, about you arriving at your desk, uh, approaching the new job and immediately getting stuck into some of the difficult decisions that you had to uh, engage in. Uh, in particular, uh, the context is that you are discussing uh, figures which have arisen relating to concerns about the rise in cases in the Glasgow area uh, and in particular uh, East Renfrewshire, uh, which seem, seem to your, on your initial analysis to be indicating uh, a cause for concern as the cases were going up. Is that, is that a fair summary of the, the context? That is fair. Um, and you, you are seeking Professor Leach's uh, input and counsel on that decision, is that right? That is correct, yeah. Uh, and you, you refer at 11.52, uh, wrapping up, I think, your, your discussion with uh, uh, Professor Leach on that subject, that you'll be on the deep dive, uh, and then Professor Leach replies, good there was some FM keep it small shenanigans as always. She actually wants none of us. Um, this is Professor Leach giving you guidance and advice on your first day in the new job, is that right? Uh, yes. And he refers to the First Minister's keep it small shenanigans and that she actually wants none of us. Was this an indication in fact that the First Minister really took decisions in connection with the pandemic herself or at least would have preferred it that way? No, I think that was as... Jason said when he gave evidence to this very inquiry, uh, an example of him perhaps uh, over-speaking. Um, I, I don't doubt, of course, that there was times when the former First Minister needed a tighter ta cast list, wanted a tighter cast list to make a decision on a very uh, specific uh, issue. Um, but uh, I think this was a, a classic example of uh, Jason perhaps uh, uh, over-speaking. When you talk about the tighter cast list, are you talking about the Gold Command or something similar? Yes, generally Gold Command. Yeah. So in essence, as I suggested to you earlier, the practice was that the decisions would be made by the First Minister gathering around her uh, a small number of close advisers uh, rather than putting the matter to Cabinet or exposing herself to the wider advisory structures of the Scottish Government. Is that correct? No, I, I would say that, again, a number of decisions uh, were taken at Cabinet, particularly uh, in terms of the overall direction in which the Government was going in relation to restrictions or uh, any decision, in fact, connected to the pandemic. It may well be that the finer detail of that decision was then delegated to the First Minister or indeed other Cabinet Secretaries. Uh, and that's where Gold Command could often uh, come in, or Gold Command may well come in when there was a development uh, in the virus and a decision had to be made either that evening or indeed uh, the next day. So to put this in this particular context, because one sees in the period of you being Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, 
a number of exchanges of this nature, where you are trying to take the counsel of Professor Leach, in particular around the question of uh, levels that different areas should be applied, uh, should be put into. Um, when you say uh, the principle would be agreed by Cabinet, but the finer detail delegated, in this context, would that mean that the Cabinet had said there should be a level system, but the First Minister and her close group would decide which uh, levels would be applied to which areas? So, forgive me, I couldn't tell you exactly uh, uh, the, uh, how the final decision on this particular... I'm instance. talking more broadly about that type yes, of decision. Yes, so I will absolutely answer uh, that question. So it would often be the case uh, that we would come to an agreement in Cabinet about exactly what level a particular area would be in. There would be some areas where, uh, given the thresholds that would look uh, at in terms of uh, whether a local authority was in one level or another, that they may well be right on that threshold or close to that threshold. Mm -hmm. So there would be uh, the decision to delegate the final decision on East Renfrewshire or Glasgow or Murray uh, to Gold Command or to First Minister to make that very final decision. So in essence, it was the small group and the First Minister who made the decision which is important, which is which uh, level the, the, uh, the particular area should go into? Not always. Uh, as I said, on a number of occasions, Cabinet would agree the exact level for the exact local authority to have to go on. There was always going to be, within 32 local authorities, some that were uh, perhaps on the cusp of going into level three, some on the cusp of level two. And ultimately, before a decision was made, uh, it was right that uh, that this final decision was delegated, uh, be it to the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Health, or others, with the most up-to-date information on case numbers, uh, the R number, and test positivity. The inquiry has heard significant evidence about the principles of transparency and accountability in documents such as the National Performance Framework. Um, <coughs> These are principles to which the Scottish Government is committed, is that correct? Yes. We have also seen uh, these principles reiterated throughout documents uh, relating to the pandemic response itself. For example, the Four Harms Framework of April 2020, is that correct? That is correct. And that tells us that the Scottish Government's position, as far as its public-facing uh, aspect was concerned, was that it wished to apply those important principles in the way that it handled the pandemic. Is that correct? That is correct. And indeed, uh, there have been a number of opportunities for you, yourself and others on behalf of the Scottish Government to reiterate your commitment to those principles uh, with regard to your participation in this very inquiry. Is that correct? That is correct. On the 29th of June, you said to the, uh, in response to a question in the Scottish Parliament, it's important that I abide by the rules of the UK Public Inquiry and the Scottish Public Inquiry to ensure that there is simply no doubt whatsoever any material that is asked for, WhatsApps, messages, emails, signal messages, telegram messages or whatever, will absolutely be handed over to the COVID inquiries and handed over to them in full. Has that always been your position? Uh, that has been my position, yes. This remains your position? Yes, that uh, any messages that we have should be handed over in full. It is important, is it not, not just for the very important purpose of engaging with subsequent public inquiries, such as this in the Scottish Inquiry, but also during the course of a public emergency which does not derive from a single event but is continuous, that material relating to the way in which decisions were taken must be retained so that proper lessons could be learned and a better response to the pandemic developed. Is that correct? That is uh, correct. And perhaps on this issue of uh, informal uh, messaging, including, of course, uh, WhatsApp messages, let me uh, reiterate uh, what I have said in the chamber just uh, a couple of hours ago. Let me unreservedly uh, apologise to this inquiry, but also uh, to those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Uh, that was bereaved by COVID, uh, by COVID for the government's, frankly, poor handling of the various Rule 9 uh, requests in relation to informal messaging messages. There's no excuse uh, for it. We should have done better. And it's why I reiterate that public apology uh, today. That ministers are, and there is awareness amongst ministers, amongst cabinet secretaries, 
um, regardless of the medium of communication, that any key decision that is in relation to uh, government business should be recorded in the corporate record and the salient points recorded on the corporate record. And that's usually done via the private office or, or via government uh, officials. Um, but I'm afraid for a, a long time, the corporate mindset of the government, uh, the organisational mindset of the government was because the corporate record had those key decisions and salient points, that was what we had to, that was the only thing really that was required to hand over to the inquiry when the inquiry uh, made it clear, of course, that uh, you're seeking uh, more uh, than that. And there is a, a gap, regardless of the records man management plan, the, the mobile messaging policy, there is clearly a gap that exists in relation to how material and informal communication should be retained uh, in relation to a statutory public uh, inquiry. That's why I've instructed a, an externally led review uh, to look at this issue and other issues, such as what ministers and cabinet secretaries should, should do, should they, for example, change device uh, in the midst, particularly, of an emergency such as a pandemic or anything that is analogous to that. Thank you. Um, in answering questions about this area, uh, one of the senior civil servants, uh, Ms Fraser, um, from the Corporate Directorate General, accepted that it was important in the interests of transparency and accountability to the Scottish public uh, that information about how decisions were reached should be retained. Do you agree with her? I do. You mentioned in your response there uh, the requirement, as I, as I understood you, uh, to retain information within the system uh, about key decisions that were made. Would you accept that both the policy in existence at the time and indeed the principles of transparency and accountability uh, require there to be careful record keeping of how decisions are made meaning that discussions leading to decisions also require to be recorded? Uh, yes, and, and again, our record management policy will make clear that it's not just the decision that has to be recorded, but I think the wording is used, the salient points around any decision that I've made should also be recorded for the corporate record. There, there's a difference, though, perhaps, that it might be quite subtle, but it's just the salient points of a decision is one thing, but the salient government business involved in the process leading to the decision is another. Do you, do you accept that both categories require to be retained in order to fulfil the ultimate objective of transparency and accountability? Yes, and uh, I accept the point uh, that you're making. I, I would say, of course, our records management policy uh, is important for a couple of reasons. One, of course, for all of the reasons that you have just articulated in relation to transparency, good governance, but also for record management. Uh, we cannot possibly, as, a, as, a, as an organisation, keep every single piece of documentation uh, that is produced by the organisation. Uh, it would be, be very, very challenging and difficult uh, to do so. So there is a need for that record management policy, and ultimately there will be a point where it will be for the interpretation, uh, the interpretation of the receiver of that information um, to, to, to decide whether or not that should be recorded in the corporate record or not. But those... Uh principles the, of transparency and accountability should aid in that interpretation? They should. Of because if there's material uh, relating to discussions uh, in the business of government, uh, it would be necessary for uh, an interested member of the Scottish public uh, to be able to access that material in order to know how decisions were taken and ultimately to know whether decisions were taken in a way with which they were satisfied. Yes, I think that's fair. As far as your production of WhatsApps and other informal messages to the inquiry is concerned, um, I think it is, it is apparent, is it not, and I think you have accepted this, that you are a, a heavy user of WhatsApp as a means of communication. Uh, I, I use it on a daily basis. And if, uh, is it the case that you used your own personal phones, plural, for WhatsApp mess messages uh, during the course of the pandemic uh, rather than a government-issued phone. Yes, that's correct. And I think it has transpired from the material you've provided that you, in fact, had multiple phones over the period from January 2020 to April 2022. Uh, both personal and government devices, yes. Yes. Um, could I ask you, please, to look at INQ 00031509509? This is a table that we went to with some previous witnesses, which was very helpfully produced to us uh, by uh, the team with whom we are dealing with in Scottish Government uh, in connection with our uh, inquiries about the usage uh, of uh, materials, uh, of uh, informal messaging systems. 
Uh, and in this, amongst other things, in this table, what we see is um, the Scottish Government's response as to what was used um, during the course of the pandemic. Uh, and it says there, as regards your WhatsApp, other informal communication systems, that you used, um, you used WhatsApp with Nicola Sturgeon and John Swinney to discuss matters. Any decisions made uh, were recorded through the appropriate channels as per ScotGov guidance. No other informal communication platforms were used. Communicated with Kevin Stewart and Marie Todd through WhatsApp. Just to pause there, they were ministers who were working with you in the time as Health Secretary, is that right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Thank Junior you. ministers in my portfolio. Thank you very much. WhatsApp used to discuss information and advice relating to COVID-19 more frequently at the beginning of the pandemic due to restrictions on in-person meetings, deleted all messages after a month for cyber security purposes as per their by which I assume it means your understanding of the Scottish Government mobile messaging apps usage and policy. Does not recall being part of any decision making via WhatsApp, part of Health for Nations WhatsApp administered by Matt Hancock, and this was disbanded after Matt Hancock left office, used for information sharing as opposed to decision making, such as number of cases, our number, etc., messages not retained. Um, this document is dated the 13th of October 2023. Um, this is what the Scottish Government represented to us as being your position as at that time, uh, to the effect that you had retained none of the messages, although that you had used uh, WhatsApp to discuss information and advice relating to COVID-19. Is that an accurate uh, representation of your position as at that time? Um, of course, that position uh, developed. Uh, we'll get on to that. I just sure, mean at, at this time. particular Sure. Mm -hmm. Is that right, yes. then? This is an accurate representation of your position? Uh, yes. Um, when, you, when you say uh, that in the opening paragraph that any decisions made were recorded through the appropriate channels, as per ScotGov guidance, um, does that indicate that your understanding of the Scottish Government guidance or policy was that only decisions made required to be recorded through the appropriate channels? Uh, no decisions and, and salient points in relation to decision-making, should have been recorded in the corporate record. Thank you. So the reference to decision there is really a shorthand for that wider group that we discussed earlier. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and when you say recorded through the appropriate channels, is that is that another way of saying, uh, we've heard this expression before from Ms Fraser and others, that, it has, that that material has been recorded on the corporate record? Yes. And how, how as a matter of practice, would you have gone about transferring the, the salient uh, points of discussions relating to important decisions onto the corporate record as a matter of practicality. Yes, and, and forgive me, I said that this was a statement that was correct uh, as per the 13th uh, of, of, of October. Uh, there's probably some areas that were obviously updated uh, thereafter, uh, which would uh, abrogate some of uh, what is in here, but I assume I'm happy yes, to, I, I, happy I'm, to I'm, speak. I am, to be absolutely fair, I'm, what I'm trying to do is just understand your position at that time. I will take you to the developments thereafter. Yeah. I, I wouldn't leave Of it. course. Uh, in terms of how that was uh, recorded, uh, if there was a discussion uh, of salient points or a decision uh, that was uh, made uh, over any informal communication, then it would often be for one of the cabinet secretaries or ministers to inform their private office or another government official who would then uh, put it into the corporate record. No decision could be actioned, of course, unless it was uh, in some way in the system. And that was usually done through, through private office. And your position is you did that in connection with all of the communications that you had but then you deleted the actual original messages. Is that right? Uh, some messages would have been uh, deleted. Uh, still recoverable, but not. Uh, but but uh, may well have been uh, deleted. Uh, I have to confess, in the midst of a uh, global uh, pandemic and the issues uh, that we were engulfed in at that point, uh, deleting uh, messages uh, routinely uh, was not always uh, the top priority. But your understanding of the policy was that what you needed to do was to record the information on the corporate record through that mechanism, your private office, um, and that there was then an obligation to delete the messages for cybersecurity reasons a month after uh, that, and in between, the material will be communicated through your private office and put on the corporate record by whoever it was in your private that office. That was the guidance in the mobile messaging yeah. uh, policy. So, but so at that stage, you hadn't produced any messages to us because they had, by that time, 13th of October, been deleted in accordance with the practice that you have laid out. They were no longer available. Yeah. Um, or so I thought, of course. Yes, indeed. Um, so 
after that, um, there were uh, discussions, you, there was a development in your position, as I understand it, and you, you provided a, a supplementary statement to the inquiry e explaining what the process had been. Because although your position as at the 13th of October uh, was that you didn't have any messages because they weren't available to you, um, you found a phone on where the messages were uh, ascertainable. Is that right? I wouldn't say I found, I retained uh, a handset, uh, my previous handset, uh, that I used up until um, about the middle of March of, so of, of last year. So you were aware that you still had in your possession that handset before the 13th of October, is that right? Th that's correct. And had you not checked that when you said that all the messages had been deleted? I had, and uh, because I had migrated my WhatsApp account onto the new device, so same number, migrated it onto the new device, um, when I went back to the old handset, uh, when I went back to WhatsApp, uh, there was just there was no messages at all. It was it was blank. Now, uh, of course, I'm happy to talk to the fact those messages were uh, recoverable, uh, thankfully, uh, by not any uh, amazing uh, technical wizardry, but actually by logging out of the WhatsApp uh, account in my current handset and logging back in in the old handset because those messages were still in the phone storage. Uh, they were be able. They were. They were uh, fairly easily uh, recoverable. So you were under the impression <clears throat> that the messages had been deleted previously in accordance with uh, uh, an existing government policy, uh, but in fact it transpired that they had not been deleted and that they were in fact recoverable relatively easily. Yes. Um, the position then was that you. Record, you were able to provide us with a large number of messages, in, including, for example, with a number of other people, but including extensive exchanges between yourself and Professor Leach of the nature that we've looked at already. Um, so that there was a large number of messages on that handset, although in some way embedded within it in a way that you couldn't originally access. Is that correct? Uh, in a way that was, uh, I didn't realise I could access when I changed device. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Your position is, I think, that those messages were, or the, the salient business points relating to discussions or decisions, were uploaded to the corporate record at or around the time when they were exchanged before the 30-day deadline expired. Yes. Is that right? So we, we have recovered, as you have said, during the course of your evidence, and you have said in another fora, um, a significant amount of documentation which the Scottish Government has provided to us, uh, which relates to uh, decision-making discussions relating to the way that the COVID-19 pandemic was managed in Scotland. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. So given the fortuitous uh, revelation of the messages which were unavailable to you but became available where, when you followed the process that you set out, it would now be possible, would it not, for us to conduct a comparison between effectively what the government has given us, the corporate record relating to these matters, and your messages in order to ascertain whether in fact you had recorded the salient points on the corporate record? Yes, although I would make the point that salient points, I suppose, is, is, is open to interpretation. Key decisions, of course, and salient points relating to that decision. Um, should be uh, noted in the corporate record, but uh, you're absolutely right, you could cross-reference. And, and we will find there, will we, that the salient points of the business you conducted over WhatsApp will be included within the corporate record. Key decisions and, and salient points related to that decision uh, should, of course, be recorded, and it was my practice uh, to then inform my private office of those key decisions of any salient points related to that um, and if I did not do that, then, uh, of course, those decisions would not be uh, taken forward. Well, just to be clear, again, slight terminology, but it might be important. Again, you're talking about decisions and salient points of decisions. But what I think you accepted, you required to put on the corporate record was also discussions relating to decisions. So will that be included on the corporate record? Uh, I think salient points would be, would be uh, recorded on uh, the records. Salient points, and that includes decision-making, but any other salient points in relation to that decision? Will that, will that include the types of discussions or the, the tenor of the types of discussions that you've been having with Professor Leach in the exhaustive messages that you have uh, now sent to this inquiry? So not, not, not every sentence... <clears throat> 
full stop apostrophe would be recorded, recorded, nor would it require to be record, recorded. But if a decision was made and any of the salient points related to that decision being made, they should be, of course, recorded on the corporate record. Because, of course, you're now telling me that they should be recorded, but you represented previously that they were on the corporate record. Is that right? I would always endeavour to put them on the corporate record, yes. Yes. If there was any uh, times that was not done, that would have been uh, a mistake made by a Cabinet Secretary, a Minister, uh, if they did not uh, do that. But, of course, the guidance is that those decisions made should be recorded and the salient points in relation to that decision also. And in your case, they were. So we should find them on that corporate record. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, that was always my intention to do that. But just to be clear, I'm not asking about your intention. My understanding is that you have told us in your evidence and also previously that you did make sure that the stuff, the, the mat relevant material was on the corporate record. Yes, we would always, when decisions are made, record, uh, record on uh, the corporate record as per the records management uh, policy. In any event, uh, First Minister, given the, 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 the uh, fortuitous discovery of these many messages, which we've read with great interest and we're obliged to you producing them subsequently, we can carry out a comparison between these two bodies to ascertain whether that's correct. Could I just ask you, you, you also provided some WhatsApp messages, not, not, although Professor Leach is a frequent correspondent, there are others with whom you corresponded uh, via that mechanism. One of them was the former First Minister and you helpfully provided us with some messages. It helpfully because the former First Minister's position is that she does not have access to any of those messages uh, conducted, uh, the WhatsApp messages, uh, involving conversations with you or indeed anyone else. Um, did you discuss the production of your WhatsApp messages to this inquiry with the First Minister, the former First Minister? No. We noted in your um, WhatsApp messages with uh, Professor Leach that there were frequently voice notes received from him. Was that, was that a frequent practice of his, do um, you recall? Uh, it was done on, certainly on occasion, and I also occasionally would use voice notes as well. Were the contents of those voice notes, insofar as uh, relating to uh, significant uh, decisions made in the course of the pandemic or discussions around them transcribed or copied into the corporate record? Again, if there were salient points from those voice notes then they would, uh, and decisions that were made in those voice notes, then of course uh, we would uh, always uh, seek to record them on the public record, so, on the corporate record. So you'd say you'd seek to do so, but can you tell me whether that did happen or not? Again, when so many decisions were made in the course of the pandemic, it would always be the practice that we would seek to do that. Uh, government ministers, cabinet secretaries would seek to do that. Uh, if there was occasions when that did not happen, uh, that I would hope would be the very rare occasion, but it should not happen. It should be the case that every single minister, cabinet secretary, myself included, uh, would uh, uh, ensure that those decisions and salient points related to those decisions were indeed uh, on the corporate record. As you uh, used your personal phones, because there were multiple phones, for uh, conducting these exchanges, and you've explained to us the process by which uh, the corporate record will be updated by you passing material to a private, your private office who would then include it in the corporate record. Um, was it then your habit to give your phone, uh, including these messages and voice notes, etc., to your uh, private office to uh, undertake that process? No, because that would not be the usual practice. Because, again, it wouldn't be uh, the case that we would expect uh, every word verbatim full stop apostrophe to be recorded. It's the salient point. So if I had a voice note uh, from uh, from the former First Minister about a decision that we had made uh, and it was for me to action, uh, then I would make sure that I would uh, inform my private office about the decision that was made after discussion with the former First Minister. And if there are salient points to record as well as that decision, then I would pass them on uh, usually uh, through an email uh, into my private office or indeed through uh, a telephone call or a face-to-face -face exchange. So the process by which the information was passed was by email. So those emails should also exist, showing how well, the information was passed. Emails or face-to-face -face or telephone calls. Um, uh, granted, less face-to-face -face, uh, during the early parts of the pandemic, given the restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be a, a number of ways of communicating the decision or indeed the salient points. It wouldn't just be by email. Certainly, it was not done by handing a phone over or copying and pasting 
a whole WhatsApp exchange. It would be, again, the decision that was made and the salient points thereafter. OK. Um, but on the occasions when you did pass that information by email, those emails would still exist and we would be able to look at those emails to understand what you had passed on. Yes, and I hope they would be passed on to the inquiry uh, already if requested. And sometimes the exchanges... For a good example, actually, is the exchange you had on your very first day, where you're trying to get to grips with some of the complex information. You're discussing things, uh, thoughts with Professor Leach. He's giving you some advice. There are numerous such exchanges. They, they, they can be quite complex, and the thinking expressed within them can be quite complex. Are you certain that where you conveyed the information to your private office verbally, as you said sometimes happened, although perhaps not at the early stages of the pandemic, was conveyed such that all of the salient points relating to the discussion made their way onto the corporate record? Again, where there was decisions that were made, I'm absolutely certain uh, of that. And if there was any misunderstanding from my private office, they would usually seek clarification. If Jason and I were having a conversation because I was asking his advice on case numbers, trajectory, or a particular area of clinical expertise that he had, um, it's not necessarily not necessary that that would be fed back into the private office or the corporate record. If there was a decision that was made or a salient point relating to that decision, then that would be <coughs> recorded on the corporate record. These processes are an important part of the Scottish Government and its key ministers upholding the principles of accountability and transparency upon which their bond of trust with the Scottish people is based. Is that correct? Uh, yes. If it were to transpire that the material which we can now see in the messages has not been put onto the corporate record and therefore would not be available for a citizen to see on the corporate record, would that bond of trust have been broken? No, I, I would disagree with that characterisation. I think it's important that we record the decisions that are made and any salient points related to that decision. We cannot, uh, I don't think, reasonably be expected as a government to record every single sentence, as I say, every full stop, uh, or, or, or apostrophe, nor is that required uh, of us. I think what's really important in terms of that bond of trust, and this was exceptionally important for issues around public compliance of restrictions, was explaining the rationale for why we made certain uh, decisions. And that was done Regularly, It was the former First Minister's practice to almost daily do a briefing uh, with the media uh, to explain they were well watched, um, as the inquiry uh, will know. Uh, and therefore, uh, exceptionally important that we did explain <coughs> the rationale for the decisions that were made. That is not always done uh, through the corporate record. It may well be done uh, through ministerial statement, uh, through daily briefing, uh, through questioning from journalists or parliamentarians. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about the uh, Cabinet Secretary role you, you held in the early pandemic. Uh, that was the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, I think uh, you were able to be, you were present at a number of the early meetings which took place in February of 2020 when information about the emerging threat had started to come through and the Scottish <coughs> Government was trying to put together some element of coordination of, of its response. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, for example, you attended a meeting of a, a, a body called SCORE, the Resilience Room, about which we've heard other evidence, uh, on the 17th of February. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Um, one of the responsibilities you had was for policing. Is that right? That is correct. Um, could I have paragraph 143, please, of the statement up, where you helpfully give us some information about this uh, situation? You say, in February 2020, my awareness of the number of people likely to be infected with COVID-19 in Scotland and in the UK, including details of any reasonable worst-case scenario, was dependent on the advice that we received from the CMO in terms of the forecast numbers of those affected. The SCORE paper, dated the 17th of February 2020, noted the RWCS figures, and this was discussed at Cabinet the day after SCORE met on the 18th of February 2020. These figures were clearly alarming, not only under, and, not, and, on, and only underlined the rationale for the government's focus being dominated by its response to the pandemic. Um, at around this time, <coughs> can you tell us what steps you took to try to uh, prepare uh, the justice system uh, for this clearly alarming situation? In particular, because within the document that was prepared for that very meeting, Criminal justice is, is, is a, an entire section that is highlighted as something likely to be impacted by, by the threat. Yes. Well, there's immediate discussions, of course, with my officials, and they focused, uh, and uh, with stakeholders, uh, some external and some as part of government uh, 
bodies and agencies. And they were predominantly focused um, on three areas, on the court system, what might be the impact, although that came slightly later on uh, than this, uh, clearly uh, in relation to prisons, and that's where some of the early focus was uh, if this virus spread throughout uh, uh, our prison population, which I'm afraid to say was uh, and continues uh, to be uh, overcrowded. And uh, with police, um, and again, I think the conversations with the police came slightly later uh, uh, than this, but uh, those were the areas of focus for me immediately once we received this reasonable worst case scenario uh, modelling paper. Well, it, it was that's a very helpful summary because uh, I was going to ask you about the prison situation as well because that was another thing within your portfolio, is that right? That's correct. You've touched on the very issue which I wanted to address with you, which was prisons, for example, weren't discussed at Cabinet until the 17th of March. Um, is it the case that uh, as far as policing and prisons were concerned, it was predictable that this alarming threat would require action, both in terms of policing for enforcement, uh, but also in terms of the, the real risk that we pose to the prison population, given their particular circumstances by this virus? I think it was immediately clear once we uh, had detail of the significant threat of COVID, how damaging it could be uh, to a prison population. And there was European examples of where uh, prisons had seen the virus uh, rip through it and through the prison uh, estate. And therefore, uh, that was one of the uh, earliest conversations I had uh, with my uh, prison officials and where necessary with the Scottish Prison Service. Given that there was no discussion of prisons um, until the 17th of March, does it suggest that perhaps Scotland was a little slow off the mark to deal with the policing and prison situation? No, no, just because it wasn't discussed uh, at Cabinet, uh, that didn't stop or inhibit uh, Cabinet Secretaries and myself as Cabinet Secretary for Justice uh, from having those conversations uh, earlier, uh, be it with officials or indeed uh, with the bodies themselves, be it Police Scotland or the Scottish Prison Service. But what systems were, discussions obviously, but what systems were actually put in place, first of all, to deal with the, what I would suggest would be the inevitable uh, requirement for the police to be involved in some level of enforcement of rules, but also the very real threat that we pose to the prison population. The prison population not, in some ways, being that different from the type of situation one saw with the Diamond Princess, although it wouldn't necessarily have an elderly population. It would involve people in confined circumstances where the virus may spread rampantly. And I think this is exactly the point. There was no need for Cabinet to sign off the Scottish Prison Service uh, looking to, for example, uh, create extra capacity so they can try to introduce uh, 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 some sort of measure of, be it social distancing or, for example, to see if they could uh, uh, remove people from, sing uh, from double cells into single cells if possible. <clears throat> um, and those decisions wouldn't require a cabinet decision to have to be made. Um, similarly, discussions with police um, when it came to issues of potential enforcement, uh, when it comes to legislation being introduced to the Scottish Parliament uh, and being passed by Scottish Parliament, it wouldn't necessarily require a cabinet decision in relation to the operational independence of the police. Police Scotland had operational independence to make decisions uh, based on uh, any, any uh, uh, legislation uh, that was passed in the subsequent uh, enforcement action. So these matters were you explained not necessarily matters that Cabinet would have to decide, but they were within your remit to decide, is that right? Uh, they were in my remit uh, to have an overview. Uh, I should stress the point about operational independence for the police. It would be absolutely a matter for the Chief Constable of, to determine of, of how they enforced and the, the, the four E's approach mm -hmm. uh, that they took was an example of a decision that uh, was made very much by the, the Chief Constable. What concrete plans were put in place with regard to the police and prisons at this early stage in March? So discussions were held around uh, with clinical experts to understand what needed to be done to try to, to, to slow uh, the uh, transmission of the virus in a uh, setting such as a crowded prison uh, estate. So at the time, the Scottish Prison Service tried to use whatever capacity it had, whatever additional space it had, to try to create, uh, for example, uh, uh, social distancing uh, measures. Um, we were, of course, in the early, early days of trying to see what testing uh, was uh, available uh, at that stage, of course, in its development uh, phase. Uh, and then regular discussions with Police Scotland, uh, and I instructed regular discussions with Police Scotland 
in order uh, to determine what actions we could take collectively uh, in relation to enforcement um, when, when that became apparent. Another area which I think from your statement you had responsibility for um, was travel restrictions in that post, is that right? For a period, yes. Yes. For, for, for a period? Over what period was it? Yes, I think uh, it, it should be open, my statement, but uh, yep. there, was a, there was a point where uh, later, after a number of months, uh, I think the Transport Minister ended up taking responsibility mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, measures, forgive me if I don't have the exact date uh, for me. But, yes, uh, I, I think that may be in the statement, First Minister, but what, what I was interested in was the way in, over the period for which you were, when you were responsible for this, the way in which that worked. Uh, in particular, you, you mentioned in your statement that there was a, a requirement um, for you to engage in discussions at a Four Nations level to deal with travel restrictions. Mm. It's an area in which we, we have an interest. Um, you, you explain in your statement that the engagement was primarily at the UK government level with the Transport Minister, but you did have limited engagement with uh, Mr Jack, who was the Secretary of State for Scotland. Um, is, was the, was the, what, what role did Mr Jack play? Because in our, in our assessment, one might have expected in an area like this, where there is an obvious need for UK four nations cross-border cooperation to the extent that it can be achieved for the Secretary of State for Scotland to play some sort of role more than what you describe as limited engagement? Uh, yes, it, 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 I can't obviously speak for the Secretary of State uh, for Scotland in terms of what engagement he had with his UK counterparts. I, I can only speak for the fact that when we were on these four nation calls, his engagement was very limited and there would often be meetings where he wouldn't say uh, anything at all and perhaps he was there to, to observe what was said on the meetings as opposed to necessarily contribute. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, of course I couldn't speak to the discussions he was involved in privately with colleagues mm -hmm. uh, and UK counterparts behind the scenes. Constitutionally, would you expect the Secretary of State for Scotland to have played a more prominent role in these discussions um, given the, the importance, I think you will accept, of the need to try to come to some sort of consensus over travel restrictions? I mean, I was curious at times why he was on the calls, if there was no contribution um, that was being made, call after call, uh, if that was the case. Um, but uh, no, ultimately, there was a devolved responsibility uh, for us in the Scottish Government, um, and there was uh, devolved responsibility to other governments in terms of their jurisdictions, England, England Wales uh, and Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. With travel, it was always going to be more difficult for uh, those uh, other nations uh, uh, outside of, uh, of, of England uh, because whatever decisions were made by the UK government for England were largely going to impact the decisions that we made uh, in Scotland, particularly mm -hmm. around international travel. Mm -hmm. uh, well, th this, is, this is what I wanted to focus on because our understanding from the evidence given by Mr uh, Kenneth Thompson, who you'll know was a senior civil servant, was that Scotland always, the Scottish Government always had uh, responsibility for uh, external borders, with the external border of Scotland, uh, because of the fact that there were, public health was a devolved matter, and that was effectively a public health decision, even although the question of borders, as far as immigration and nationality is concerned, is a reserved matter. Um, so, as far as we understand the position, from the very beginning, Scotland effectively controlled its own borders. But uh, is that correct? Is that your understanding? It's a very complex matter uh, and complex issue, just as you have uh, articulated it. Ultimately, if we, when we got to the phase of decision making, when we were looking at international travel corridors, we we're looking at various different lists, whether a country should be on a green list, an amber list, a red list, uh, you are absolutely correct. Scotland could have made a decision, and there was occasions when we made decisions mm. where we put countries uh, on a different list to the UK government, for example. But that was rarely done, because ultimately uh, there was implications when the UK government made a decision to put a country in England on a green list. Ultimately, if we went and put that country in an amber or red list, people may well just arrive into port in England and come up to Scotland. Mm. Uh, therefore, uh, we would be at a disadvantage both in terms of the virus, but also uh, in terms of our uh, airports uh, as well. So we, we could make decisions uh, around uh, inbound travel uh, and what lists country were on immigration, uh, of course, uh, mattered. Uh, it was, was still a reserved matter and remains that way. Mm. So would you say that in practice and constitutionally, the question about who ultimately controlled the borders was a, a blurry distinction? 
yes, to an extent, I think that's that's right. Um, I think it was known that we could, when it came to determining whether countries were on a particular list, we could, as a Scottish government, make a decision. Um, and that decision could be different to other nations in the UK and vice versa. But I think it was also well understood that if, if there was divergence, then ultimately um, the decision that was made by the UK government for England, uh, that was going to have an impact mm -hmm. on Scotland, Wales and, and Northern Ireland, given the ports of entry. Mm -hmm. for, yes, so for the reason you just discussed, which I think was people could arrive in England and travel to Scotland, and therefore Scotland would still have the public health detriment, if you like, of, of that. So there was a need... And I, economic I, detriment as yes, well. Yes, yes, indeed, the, the, the detriments. I... I think, therefore, that is it correct to say that this was an area in which there was a, a requirement for good intergovernmental relations to try and be consistent about the policy, to try and do the best for the people of Scotland to protect them from any of these threats? Uh, yes, certainly required uh, collaboration in the, uh, in the interest of public health. Did you find you got that collaboration? Uh, it was frustrating at times. For me, in my engagement with the UK government, and if you're asking me specifically around... Um, international travel, yes. um, I had uh, a good working relationship, uh, professional relationship, personally and politically, of course, often differences, um, but we had to just put that aside and uh, work collaboratively as best we could in the interests of public health. But there were occasions, particularly in relation to international travel, where I was deeply frustrated at the fact that um, either information coming to us, and it was usually information from uh, the JBC, the, the Joint uh, Biosecurity Centre, um, or uh, other sources, was coming to us at the absolute last minute, before a meeting, five, ten minutes before a meeting was to start. Or we were reading about an announcement of a decision already being made by the UK government, which again was their prerogative, it was their right to make a decision about uh, what countries were on what list for England. But that undoubtedly had an impact on the decisions that we were then going to have to make. You say, as a result of that phenomenon, at paragraph 53 of your report, that um, if the UK government had decided and announced in relation to international travel restrictions that a country was on the green list, the Scottish government often have to follow the decision made by the UK government as international travellers could arrive in England and travel domestically to Scotland otherwise. This is also an example of decision-making by the UK government which was driven by an England-only understanding of policy issues. So from, from that assessment and the, the analysis you've given about the way in which these decisions were often announced before the Scottish Government knowing anything about them in the press, it does tend to suggest in this regard that there was not a good working relationship over this important issue. Is that your position? Uh, no. Again, it was done uh, on occasion and that was frustrating. But ultimately, um, I found that where we had to work together, where we had to collaborate with the UK Government, um, in the areas where I have responsibility as Justice Secretary and as uh, Health uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, uh, often we could collaborate uh, in the interests of, of, of public health. But, uh, you know, to be frank, it could be frustrating on occasion. What responsibilities do you have in that post for the internal border, the border between Scotland and England? Uh, could we say that again? Sorry, what responsibilities do you have in that post uh, oh. mm. for uh, the border between Scotland and England, the internal border? Yes, for the internal uh, border, uh, again, uh, where decisions were made, and there was periods throughout the pandemic where decisions were made around cross-border travel, uh, the responsibility I would have would be liaising with Police Scotland, but ultimately it would be an operational decision for Police Scotland to determine how they might well enforce any ban that might have existed between cross-border uh, travel. So my, my, my uh, real role was uh, with interaction uh, with Police Scotland, accepting, of course, it was an operational decision about how many resources or assets they deployed uh, to the border. Um, but, uh, yes, my main, my main interaction would be with Police Scotland in that regard. I think in, we understand, it was certainly reported in December 2020 that there was a ban from the Scottish government side on travel between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think that's the correct date. Yeah. And you um, would therefore, you, you detail in your statement, your very regular contact with Police Scotland throughout this and the whole of this period. Was, was that something that you discussed with them as regards how that would be enforced? Uh, I discussed the decision that was made and uh, the Chief Constable informed me 
uh, of uh, his, uh, his uh, intention in terms of how to react. Uh, my my uh, memory, and of course I will correct it if I'm uh, wrong, was that he was going to double the number of patrols that were near the border at that point. Now, there would be no checkpoints, and he was very, very clear about that, but he was looking to increase the number of uh, police assets uh, near the border to effectively act as a deterrent. So when you say there was a ban, it seems that there was a reluctance on the part of Police Scotland to do very much about uh, enforcing it. Is that correct? Well, again, I think there was an understanding also from the Scottish Government that police resources were very, very stretched. Nobody expected uh, there to be a mass deployment of police resources down uh, at the border. We understood how busy Police Scotland were and they were very integral to our response uh, to uh, ensuring public health at the time of the pandemic. Thank you. While we're on the subject of enforcement, I had a few questions for you about that as well. Um, the, government, the Scottish Government chose to enforce the regulations, such as the stay-at-home requirements, by way of fixed penalty notices. Is that correct? That is correct. And we understand from your statement that the level of the fixed penalty notices were a matter which you decided upon. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, a fixed penalty notice is in essence an on-the-spot fine typically issued by police officers in respect of minor breaches of the law, which does not count as a criminal conviction, but is recorded on police systems and may be disclosed via an enhanced disclosure application within a certain period of time. Is that your broad understanding? Yes, that is correct. Um, why was it that you chose to enforce, uh, the Scottish Government chose to enforce uh, the regulations in that particular way. Uh, can I say that uh, I understand uh, that there will be very different viewpoints on uh, the use of fixed penalty uh, notices. And from a government perspective, um, we had to have some sort of deterrent once the regulations were in place. We thought that was important in relation to compliance but understanding that the vast majority of compliance would take place without any police interaction whatsoever. In fact, if I went a step further, even when it came to police interaction or police activity, the vast overwhelming majority of that would be done without enforcement. And the police had their, their four E's uh, approach, with enforcement being the very last uh, E uh, that they chose to deploy. And uh, my understanding from the figures that I've seen is that police activity during this period 94% uh, of police activity uh, didn't require an FPN, a fixed penalty notice, whereas only 6% required that level of enforcement action. Did you or the Scottish Government more broadly give consideration to the possibility of seeking to enforce the regulations without using fixed penalty notice? I, I think our, uh, and my recollection is that uh, our concern would be that if we used anything else, so for example a, a recorded warning, uh, that it would not have the same impact or effect or understanding. I think we were very conscious that people understood what a fixed penalty notice was. People may have had it for speeding, littering, mm. uh, and so on. So it was an understood, uh, well understood system, whereas a formal police recorded warning might not have the same impact mm. uh, or, or, or effect. So uh, it was the government's uh, view that a fixed penalty notice was the right uh, uh, mechanism uh, to use for deterrence purposes. Was it was was that not precisely potentially the problem with fixed penalty notices in this circumstance? Because whereas they might be used and there is an existing administrative system to uh, process them for things like speeding, speeding offences are relatively cut and dry. Whereas the question as to whether someone is breaking one of these uh, regulations by, for example, not being at home without a reasonable excuse is a much more difficult and nuanced question to answer. I, I'm, I'm interested in whether consideration was given within the Scottish Government to alternative means of trying to ensure that the rules were followed, other than the FPN system. Yeah, forgive me, I would have to look over our previous Cabinet discussions, but certainly uh, I know uh, that uh, there was uh, certainly uh, an understanding that there was other systems available, such as formally recorded police uh, warnings. I think for uh, the confidence that we had in police officers was that uh, 
every single day, I suspect, police officers have to try to exercise judgment. You're right, there are some issues which are just cut and paste. They're dry, they're black and white. You understand exactly uh, whether or not uh, an offence has been committed and therefore a fixed penalty notice must be issued. But Police Scotland, police officers, I think every day probably are in that area uh, where they have to make a judgment about whether an offence uh, has been committed uh, or not. So there was, there was certainly a, a belief in Police Scotland's ability if it was necessary to, to, to issue a fixed penalty to notice that they would do that in the correct and appropriate manner. There was also an understanding amongst all of us, government, police Scotland, that enforcement such as a, a fixed penalty notice would only ever be the absolute last resort. Therefore, we did not expect um, there to be uh, a significant amount of fixed penalty notices issued. The inquiry has heard some evidence from Professor McVie on the subject of enforcement. Uh, in her statement at uh, paragraphs 8.1 to 8.2, excuse me, <clears throat> she suggests that internal Scottish government correspondence suggests that Scottish ministers took the lead from the UK government on offences and fixed penalties. Um, at uh, paragraph 13 um, of, a, of a separate document which she relies upon, she also suggests that the decision also administratively, as you've suggested, fitted in with an existing uh, system uh, of um, uh, anti-social behaviour legislation. Uh, what I'm interested to try to explore, First Minister, is the extent to which any real consideration was given to the possibility of not using this method, method of enforcement, um, or whether uh, it was simply adopted because it was the approach the UK government had decided upon. Well, I think our, our default position was uh, to go down the fixed penalty notice uh, route. So, Professor McVie, uh, whose evidence uh, I have read and, and summary of uh, her work I, I have also read, um, makes some very important points for us to absolutely reflect on uh, as a government. I think it was our default to go to the FPN, uh, down the FPN route, because it was well understood and all of our behavioural scientists would tell us uh, that in order to get greater levels of compliance, those decisions, uh, regulations, guidance, all of that uh, should be well understood. And if it's well understood, then there's a greater chance of uh, compliance. There were some differences in terms of the FPN uh, structure in Scotland and England. I think we had different levels of fines, if I remember uh, correctly, our fine level um, slightly lower uh, than, than what was uh, in England. So slightly different, uh, slight differences, but ultimately, yes, the FPN route towards the default. And, sorry. I've just had a, the transcript's got webinar freeze. Has that transcript got webinar freeze at the bottom? So I'm, cons I'm wondering whether the, we, we ought to take the break now. We're very close to the break anyway, my lady. I think yeah. that sounds like a good um, option. Sorry about this, but um, it's, it's obviously important. I don't know if that means that people aren't following it, are able to follow it online. We can look into that, of course, my lady. Thank you. I should be back in, um, provided we've, everything's up and running. Um, it's time. Ten past three.
I gather we're back up and running, Mr Dawson. If it happens again, I will continue on the basis that we can still have a transcript made, because obviously, although I have a duty to make sure this is, these proceedings are accessible as possible, there are limits when technology fails us. Thank you very much, my lady. Um, First Minister, if I could just return to a point that we were discussing a little bit earlier in the conversation that has been brought to my attention by the Scottish Government legal team. It related to our discussion about uh, publication of Cabinet minutes. We were discussing uh, matters on the basis that Cabinet minutes would be accessible. and They've asked me to clarify um, or point out, perhaps, that in fact, automatically, Cabinet minutes are not released until no. after a period of 15 years. Is that your understanding? Uh, yes, we yes. just released a whole tranche of papers, in fact. Just yeah, yes, yes. but, but <coughs> for our purposes in our discussion, I think the material point uh, is, uh, do you accept uh, that documents which exist are susceptible to a freedom of information request by an interested citizen? Documents which do not exist are not. Isn't yeah. that right? Yes, yes, and I think I, I, in answer to your question, referenced uh, FOI because that's exactly how somebody might be able to uh, attain some documents. Uh, of course, exemptions do apply to FOI legislation, but yes, that's correct. Yes, thank you very much. We, we were talking uh, before the short break uh, about the process which had been undertaken to try and work out how Scotland would go about enforcing the regulations, and you told us about some of the processes. You, you, you intimated that Scotland had some differences, although the fixed penalty notice system was broadly similar uh, to that in England. Um, one other matter which has been brought up with other witnesses is the fact that one difference was that Scotland's FPN system applied to 16 to 18 year olds. Um, this was a matter uh, which, again, was covered uh, with Professor McVie. Um, what uh, active consideration was given to that difference between the UK government system and the Scottish government system such that younger people would be caught by the FPN system in Scotland? Yes. Uh, in my recollection, though again, uh, happy to be corrected if wrong, but that, that of course, was changed uh, by regulation. It, it, was, pretty, it was changed subsequently, yes. Yes, and pretty early on. Uh, after regulations uh, were passed in order to bring us into line with our requirements in relation to the United Nations Convention of the Rights of uh, the Child. So it was raised to, to 18. Uh, the reason uh, why that was perhaps not given consideration uh, early on was uh, the thinking that if this was to act as a deterrent, uh, it, it, should it capture as many people as possible uh, in order to then subsequently have the public health uh, benefits. But on reflection, uh, that wasn't uh, the, 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 the right calculation to make or the right uh, factors to consider. The, the, the correct factor in, in relation to those who are 16 to 18 uh, is, of course, their rights. And uh, that's why we made the change, as I say, to align us more closely with the UN uh, CRC. So the, the change was made, you're absolutely right, First Minister. It was the Coronavirus Number 2 Scotland Act amended the existing Regulation 9 to raise the age to 18, which came into effect on the 27th of May mm -hmm. of 2020. However, what I'm interested in is the extent to which consideration was given to Scotland's and the Scottish Government's uh, international obligations with regard to children uh, in setting the age at 16 at the start. Mm. Was that considered? Um, again, uh, my, my recollection is that the default the position that we landed on in the beginning uh, was uh, FPNs uh, to include 16 to 18 year olds. So we were always, throughout any decision that was made, always trying to balance a number of rights. Uh, so again, I would have to look over uh, previous discussions and, and, and minutes. Uh, I would be surprised if we did not consider whether or not uh, we should raise the age at that point but decided on balance not to. Um, but of course, that was again subsequently changed upon further reflection and representations made by the likes of the Children's Commissioner, uh, Scottish Human Rights Commission uh, and others. In her report, Professor McVie suggests at paragraph 8.3 that there is no available evidence to suggest that Scottish or UK lawmakers gave consideration to equality issues in respect of the decision to use fixed penalties. Is that a correct assessment? of the position? She's taking 
technically correct, although we used EQIA's equality impact uh, assessments across a range of different decisions, um, I don't think there was one I'm, I'm interested specifically in specific on you. the issue around fixed penalty notes. So. so there was no such assessment. Professor McVie's impression is correct. Uh, her impression is correct. Thank you very much. Um, in January 2021, as we know, uh, the Scottish Government introduced a new stay-at-home order uh, and um, some consideration was given around that time, as I understand it, to the way in which um, the, uh, the enforcement should continue over, over that period. Uh, and you were involved in that at that time. <coughs> Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, could I look, please, at INQ 0002144567? Um, I'm looking at paragraph 20, please. Excuse me, just one second. Yes, sorry, I have, um, I think it's subsection H. Yeah, this, this is um, from the minutes of the 4th of January. Um, it's, it says there, obviously, there was a, a question about how enforcement should work in the second lockdown, effectively. You said, where, where it says, you, Mr Yusuf undertook to speak to the Chief Constable to ensure that enforcement actions were being taken forward with due speed and rigour, based on an inadverted commas, maximalist approach. And it was likely that this would be met with a call for increased police resources. In addition, environmental health officers with appropriate police support would need to enhance their monitoring of compliance with local restrictions. Um, maximalist approach appears in inverted commas. Was that, was that your expression? Uh, I don't recall if it was uh, my uh, uh, expression or another uh, Cabinet Secretary's uh, expression, but I certainly uh, associated myself with the remarks and with that mm. uh, what, what, approach. What, whether you use that exact word or not, what was meant by that approach? Yes, what was meant by a maximalist approach was, and, and again setting the context uh, exactly as you have already done, that uh, we were uh, dealing uh, with the resurgence of the virus, and think at that point uh, a new variant uh, of uh, the variant recently uh, uh, having been discovered uh, more transmissible than the previous. Um, real concern uh, around uh, the spread of that virus, uh, and therefore uh, a real need uh, to ensure that uh, restrictions were abided by, so maximalist approach. Uh, meaning, uh, I suppose, what is said in, in the rest of that sentence, that there would be a greater police uh, resource allocation towards uh, enforcement of the regulations. Uh, and again, that enforcement always took that four E's approach, with enforcement being the very last resort. D does it not suggest that there should be more emphasis on the enforcement element rather than the other E's in the policy? No, not necessarily. Uh, it's a maximalist approach. So trying to cover, uh, I think, is uh, trying to cover ge geographically as much of the country as we could, but also the various sectors uh, and uh, elements of society where regulations impacted and yeah. affected, uh, and therefore uh, a, a greater coverage of police resource may well be required. Hence, the rest of the sentence likely that this would be met with a call for increased. Uh, police uh, resource as opposed to uh, any uh, uh, additional focus on the enforcement element. That, that was never a uh, conversation that was had. The Chief Constable was always very, very, the former Chief Constable was always very keen to stress to me that he did not want um, the policing by consent model uh, to be diluted in any way, shape or form and that he and his officers would always put an emphasis on the first three E's, uh, the engage, the explain, the encourage, before they would end up at the enforcement space. What uh, equality impact assessment was done of your uh, proposal that there should be a new maximalist approach? I don't think there would be an EQIA on uh, a decision to, for example, increase police uh, resource. Uh, there will have been... EQIAs in relation to the regulations uh, themselves, but you wouldn't necessarily do a, an equalities impact assessment on, on an approach, an operational approach uh, that was perhaps taken. It would be important in order to try to uh, adhere to the four E's approach that you've referred to, that people should be able to understand the regulations clearly. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. What was done at this time in particular to try to ensure that people understood precisely what the regulations were? A whole range of activity. Uh, of course, uh, the well-watched uh, media briefings were going to be important. 
there was communication that would have gone out from the government uh, where necessary from Police Scotland as well, and that would be materials not just on the television, on the radio, uh, social media assets uh, would be deployed uh, as well. So we always endeavour to do our best to ensure that there was a wide uh, understanding as possible of the regulations uh, and indeed the guidance. And uh, we know that at times and on occasion that could be particularly complex. The rules required to be clear so that people could comply with them, is that correct? Yes, as clear uh, as they could be uh, would help in relation to compliance. Yes, that's correct. Could I go to INQ 00033472, please? Just come up in a second. This is from a later period when you had moved into your uh, new position as the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care. I'd like to ask you some questions about an exchange uh, in this uh, page on the 19th of November 2021 from uh, 1958. Again, this is one of your regular conversations uh, with Professor Leach. Um, you, you ask a question of Professor Leach. I know you, you, you refer to, in the, in the blank passage, to an event that you are going to attend. Uh, and it says, I know sitting at the table, I don't need my mask. If I'm standing talking to folk, need, need my mask on, you ask. Professor Leach says, officially, yes, but literally no one does. Have a drink in your hands at all times, uh, then you're exempt. So if someone comes over and you stand, uh, lift your drink, and then you say, uh, in response to that, um, after a couple of further uh, comments at 2005, that's what I've been doing at the other events I'm at, exclamation mark. Um, when you, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, feel the need to clarify the rules about face masks, uh, what chance do others have in understanding the rules? Look again, as, let me try to wrap some context if I can. As the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, I didn't just double trick double-check the rules, triple-check them. I would quadruple-check them if I had to, because the intensity of the public scrutiny that we were under, as politicians of, of, of all stripes and colours, but particularly as the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health, I knew that I would always be under scrutiny to make sure that I was absolutely following every regulation and every guidance. And so it should be thus. Uh, that is absolutely uh, right, and I'm not complaining about that. So it would not be unusual for me to check in with either the National Clinical Director, uh, Professor Leach, or the CMO to, as I say, double, triple, quadruple check uh, my understanding of particular nuances in relation uh, to guidance. I always wanted to make sure that I was absolutely complying. And this was a nuance in particular guidance. And I, I also can't deny, Mr Dawson, that there was times when the rules were complex. And we got to our, ourselves into a position, I remember, during the course of the pandemic, where we were talking about things like vertical drinking. These are phrases that we hadn't used before, uh, didn't mean much uh, to folk. And we were responding in real time to events trying to balance the four harms as best we possibly could. So I would say in, on, on the vast overwhelming majority of cases, when we produced regulation and the associated guidance, uh, they, were, they were well understood, but clearly I believe one of the lessons we could and should learn is that in the development of that guidance, could we have taken a bit more time, engagement sometimes with industry, be it hospitality or others, and was there more that we could have done to simplify some of the more complex uh, guidance as this was? But look, my ultimate assertion is that for the vast overwhelming majority of cases, the rules were well understood, aided by media briefing, uh, aided by additional uh, marketing, social media campaigns, etc. The requirement to wear a face mask in certain circumstances was a part of the Scottish Government's strategy towards fighting the virus at this time? Yes. It was... An important part, or else it wouldn't have been part of the strategy. Isn't that right? That is correct, yes. Was it a matter of concern to you that the National Clinical Director informed you that n literally no one follows this particular rule? Again, for those that know Jason, I think by his own admission, uh, he would uh, perhaps have a, a casual 
way of speaking and, and perhaps uh, uh, over-speak, as he described it. So when he says, but literally no one does, uh, that to me uh, suggested, yes, that, uh, uh, that on this particular nuance, when it comes to being at a dinner or a reception, that when standing, speaking to people, uh, there wasn't people uh, wearing masks uh, as per the guidance uh, we had. You were seeking his counsel as regards what the rule was, isn't that right? Uh, yes. And as you said already, as the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, you're under particular scrutiny to follow the rules to the letter, isn't that right? Yes. Professor Leach was giving you a loophole or a workaround to try to, to try and enable you not to comply with the rules, isn't that right? No. Again, uh, I was asking uh, if I uh, just claim clarification on how to comply. He was, of course, telling me how to comply. If someone, uh, if someone comes over to you and you stand and you lift your drink, so if you have a drink in your hand, if you're sipping, taking a drink, then obviously you cannot do that uh, with uh, a mask. Uh, I never asked for a workaround or how not to comply, and neither do would I suggest that he was uh, giving uh, that. Um, for me, it was important, given the public scrutiny in my role, that I absolutely double and triple checked. Uh, the rules, and I did that on occasion with Jason, sometimes with others as well. Thank you, First Minister. Can I, I'm sorry to jump around in the time, in the chronology, but I'm, I'd like to ask you a question about something which happened again in your first rule before the election. Um, could I look at INQ 00033682, please? This again is... Uh, in a slightly different format, I think, uh, some of the WhatsApp messages that you helpfully provided to us. Um, it's a WhatsApp exchange, uh, the, the one I'm looking at is, is between yourself and uh, Mr. Swinney. I'm looking at 19-6-2020 at 10-26. Um, you're, Mr. Swinney says to you that you have just caught up with the latest insight into SPF thinking. Is that the Scottish Police Federation? That's correct. And you reply, they're a disgrace Right through this pandemic, they have shown an arrogance and retrograde thinking. Chief was livid last night. Can you explain, please, in what regard the Scottish Police Federation were, in your view, a disgrace? Well, again, this was me expressing my frustration uh, in a what would have been a private conversation uh, with a colleague. And sometimes you, when you are venting those private uh, frustrations uh, to a colleague, uh, you, 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 you use language that you regret. And like, I had a good relationship with the Scottish Police Federation. We didn't always get along, uh, the previous leadership of the Scottish Police Federation. In fact, it's fair to say at times we would have very robust uh, disagreements. Um, my uh, concern uh, uh, in this uh, particular instance, if I remember uh, correctly, uh, was that I, I didn't think that they were being uh, supportive of the Chief Constable uh, and uh, police officers more generally uh, in relation to enforcement of regulations. Uh, and I thought that the way they uh, articulated that uh, was deeply, deeply unhelpful. These were the people upon whom you relied, the police officers, to enforce the regulations which the government had imposed. Isn't that right? Police Scotland, uh, of course, and police officers as part of Police Scotland uh, were the ones that we relied on. Of course, the Scottish Police Federation were the professional body uh, that uh, represented uh, police officers. But my concern was not with uh, police officers or individual police officers. Far from it. I had the greatest amount and continue to have the greatest amount of respect. They were absolutely integral to our public health. Uh, to, our, to our public health efforts. And my concern was with the leadership at the time of the Scottish Police Federation, with, who, as I say, had a good relationship, one where we spoke uh, on, on regular occasion, uh, had robust exchanges. Uh, but at this point, as I say, venting a frustration to a colleague in a, in a private space. Thank you. I'd like to ask you some more questions, please. Again, sorry to jump around in the sorry. timeline, about the period during which you were Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care. It might be helpful, first of all, to try and place your appointment in some degree of context uh, before we do so, in terms of what happened over the period, but in particular what the state of the pandemic was at the time of your appointment. Um, the, in April uh, of uh, 2020, uh, Scotland's R number um, had fall sorry, 2021, Scotland's R number had fallen for the first time in four weeks. 
uh, dropping from between 1 and 0 0.8 to 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. Um, on the 25th of April, free lateral flow kits had been made available for anyone without symptoms. Uh, on the 26th of April, there had been a significant opening up with non-essential shops, gyms, swimming pools, pubs, restaurants and cafes allowed to reopen, while travel between Scotland and the rest of the UK was also permitted again. On the 6th of May, uh, which was the day of the election, you'll recall, uh, First Minister, uh, public health officials warned that in Murray, uh, they were experiencing an uncontrolled, sustained community transmission of COVID-19, uh, with a case rate of 81 in 100,000. On the 17th of May, most of mainland, and Scot mainland Scotland, with the exception of Murray uh, and Glasgow, moved from level three to level two restrictions, allowing pubs and restaurants to open for indoor service. And indeed, as I think we've seen from some earlier messages, uh, there was a concern really as almost exactly the point of your appointment, First Minister, about cases starting to rise in the Glasgow area. Does that give a fair description as to the background of the situation that you walked into, or are there any other salient features of the pandemic that you, you would wish to point out? Uh, no, I think that's a, a fair description of the point uh, by which I was appointed. I think the only thing I would, I would add to that is there continue to be extreme pressure on the health service uh, as well yes. and, and usually by spring uh, out with the pandemic you would begin to see some sort of easing though you tend to have respiratory uh, viruses uh, sometimes uh, during the Easter holidays but you would tend to see a bit of easing that was simply not the case uh, but other than that I think you've yeah. covered the and, salient and, and points. Looking prospectively during the period in which you did serve in the post uh, up to April 2022 the period in which we are interested in this module yeah. Um, would it be fair to say that your period in office was characterised by very considerable rises in the number of cases, broadly speaking, from around about the summer of 2021? Yes, there would be fluctuations, uh, of course, uh, there would be, but of uh, the time that I was appointed, there was a number of waves of the pandemic, and uh, of course, uh, in 2021, uh, we also then had to deal with the Omicron uh, yes, variant. If we just take it sort of in a stepwise fashion, we, we've seen some evidence from st some uh, statistical experts that in the summer of 2021, not long after your appointment to this post, cases started rising significantly, and that that was associated with the Delta variant of the of the uh, of the virus. Is that your broad recollection? Yes. Nice. Um, and as you say correctly. Um, Cases remained high, they were up and down, but they remained comparatively high in Scotland compared with the rest of the United Kingdom uh, over that period. Do you remember that being the case? Over what period? The period from the summer till the Omicron arrival towards the end of the year that you described. Yes, uh, cases uh, were fluctuating, rising often. Um, in terms of how they compared to the rest of the UK throughout that period from the summer till mm -hmm. the arrival of Omicron, <clears throat> um, there will have been, I'm sure, periods where case numbers in Scotland, the R number, may well have been lower than other nations in the UK, but for a period, absolutely, well, we've been we, higher. I'm simply seeking to paint a broad picture, First Minister. We, we've been through the detail of it with other witnesses. But as you say, what then happened towards the end of the year is that it was a further wave of the Omicron which was a much more transmissible um, uh, variant of the virus, resulting in huge increases in the number of cases in Scotland. Would that be broadly fair? Yes. We've seen some statistics that would suggest that at the peak of the Omicron wave, 8% of people in Scotland were infected, whereas at the peak of the first wave, only around 1% were infected, based on uh, analysis of retrospective uh, figures. So there were, there were huge numbers of infections to deal with. And, and is, that, is that broadly, again, your recollection? Yes, absolutely. And again, over this period, we've seen evidence that although the Omicron um, variant was generally deemed to be less virulent, um, it was much more transmissible, but it also resulted in Scotland in this third wave combined uh, in very nearly as many deaths as had occurred in each of the first two waves. With, a, with somewhere around about 5,000 deaths having occurred oh. in each wave bro broadly. Again, is that probably a recollection of the experience that you had as Cabinet Secretary over that period? Yes, I couldn't swear by the exact number, but yes, broadly, but broadly that's... I, I'm, I'm simply seeking to illustrate that even although Omicron was less virulent, it was way more transmissible. Way more transmissible, highly, highly and, transmissible. And, and they, which resulted <clears> in... Uh, the same number of deaths in this third wave as there had been yeah. in each of the first two waves. 
Was that broadly your recollection? Yes. And another characteristic, which you touched upon yourself, of this period was that in many areas, hospitals started to become overwhelmed. Isn't that right? Extreme pressure on our hospitals, yes. Many health boards required to suspend uh, non-urgent surgery at yep. different times. That is correct, particularly in the run-up to winter. They had to make the really difficult decision of uh, stopping elective care, uh, in some cases, altogether. The military required to be called in at times to assist. Uh, yes, we made MACA requests uh, at times uh, in relation to ambulance services in particular. You described at one point over this period uh, as, as Scotland, the, the situation as Scotland facing a perfect storm. Do you recall that? I do. Given that NHS capacity had been such a priority in the <coughs> strategy, which had been adopted in connection with the first wave of the virus, why was it that hospitals were allowed to become overwhelmed in this wave of the virus? It wasn't the case that they were allowed to become overwhelmed. We had a perfect <coughs> storm uh, of issues and factors that came together. We had, as you have very well articulated, a highly transmissible variant of the virus. Uh, we had, of course, been opening up society. That was right because of the vaccination uh, programme. Uh, we had some element of other respiratory viruses, although uh, flu uh, didn't hit us as, in as big a way as it did in 2022. And of course, we had the other peak pressures that you tend to see uh, during uh, the winter uh, period. Uh, but when you have a highly transmissible variant, as Omicron was, way more transmissible than previous variants, uh, hitting you at about the winter time, where, of course, not just where you often see other respiratory viruses, but people tend to mingle more, uh, go to social events more often, uh, Christmas parties, New Year functions, then all of these factors coming in together made the pressure on the NHS extreme. You say in your statement at paragraph 23 that you are provided with advice, information and evidence from a myriad of clinical and scientific experts, Scottish and intergovernmental advisory groups and stakeholders. Um, and then you say at paragraph 63 that there wasn't a risk of information overload or repetition for key decision makers. Um, would it be fair to say that the main person to whom you turned for clinical rather than medical advice was Professor Leach? Uh, yes, and the CMO who would attend virtually every, every cabinet, but I probably spoke to the National Clinical Director uh, more than I spoke to another clinical expert. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the WhatsApps, which you helpfully provided, um, show you interacting with Professor Leach on a regular basis, yes. um, so sometimes several times an hour, um, in relation to uh, queries which have arisen from your analysis of the paperwork or the issues and seeking counsel from him. Was that your default position, to use your own expression? Um, yes, it would depend also on the nature of the advice that was required. But yes, I would turn to <laughs> Professor Leach uh, as a health advisor and a clinical expert um, when I needed that uh, health advice. And you're right, uh, that could be multiple times a week. It could be even multiple times a day, depending on what was going on at the time. You say it would depend on the type of advice that would be required as to when you would turn to Professor Leach or perhaps others. But what advice would you seek from others that you wouldn't seek from Professor Leach? So, for example, if there was issues particularly in relation to, to medicines, uh, to viral, antiviral treatments, um, I may well go to Alison Strath, who was the chief pharmaceutical officer uh, at the time. So, dependent on what was needed or what was uh, required, um, it would depend who I'd go to. But I, I'm not arguing with your assertion. Your assertion uh, is correct. That uh, in terms of my health advisors, uh, which uh, I have to say were excellent throughout the course of the pandemic, uh, I would most often go to Professor Leach. And we have looked at the paperwork for the Scottish COVID advisory group over this period, of which you'll no doubt be aware, and we've heard evidence from a number of its prominent members. Um, one thing which is perhaps striking about the uh, frequency of the meetings of that group is that they became very less frequent in the period when you were in this particular position. From June 2021, they met only monthly, although they had met much more frequently previously, with the exception of a 
cluster of meetings in December of 2021 in connection with the Omicron threat that we've discussed. Um, was it the case that very much less advice was sought from that expert group and more reliance was placed on the in-house medical and clinical and scientific advisors, um, given the fact that over this period, attention had turned away from managing the threat of the virus and towards managing the recovery from COVID? I think from my perspective, it was only natural that the C19 ad advisory group would be relied on more heavily in the early days of the emergency phase of the pandemic, while we're still trying to grapple with the epidemiology of the virus, the characteristics of the virus. Uh, and of course, work was still ongoing in relation to a vaccine. What can you do in relation to uh, NPIs, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, in advance of a vaccine? So the reliance on uh, an, an advisory group that would often engage with the CMO or would give written submissions uh, to uh, cabinet secretaries uh, of the government as a whole, the reliance on that group would have been far greater when the group first set up and in that real emergency phase uh, of the pandemic. You're right to point out that the frequency of the meetings increased when the Omicron variant uh, came in, and that, that stands to reason, because during the recovery phase, by this point, by, by just kind of pre-Omicron, we would have had a good handle in understanding the uh, characteristics of the virus, we would have had, of course, a vaccination programme underway. Uh, we would have understood uh, the non-pharmaceutical interventions and the impacts that they would have in the virus and containment uh, and delay uh, 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 of, the, of, the, of the spread of the virus. Mm. Um, but where we needed that C19 group, for example, if a new variant came on and to understand uh, its impact and effects, then we knew we could always rely on the C19 group. And there was, of course, other groups, which I know the inquiry is well aware of, some at a UK level, uh, SAGE, Nerf TAG, uh, and Joint Biosecurity Council, the UK HSA, mm -hmm. and some, of course, at a Scottish level that we could rely on too. Eight times as many infections as in the first wave, almost 5,000 deaths, hospitals overwhelmed, the military called in. Why was this not an emergency phase of the pandemic? The emergency phase that we tend to talk about, I think, was uh, pre uh, when, the, when the virus uh, first came uh, and arrived into the UK, and therefore the, the very first non pharmaceutical interventions had to be considered. In my experience, and I said this, I believe at the time, this was an emergency in relation to our health service. There was no uh, doubting that. But you yourself have used the phrase that this was seen as the recovery phase. I think that's right. Uh, we were generally seen as being in that recovery uh, phase uh, at this point. But was it a health emergency? Was it a health crisis? For sure. Uh, we were facing the most extreme pressure that the NHS had seen at that point uh, in its over 70-year uh, existence. Uh, I think, the, the, again, up until that point, the winter of 2021, I don't think the NHS would have had a more difficult winter in its history. In the period before your appointment, we are aware of a number of what were called deep dive meetings taking place. There were a number of deep dive meetings in a number of different areas, but the deep dive meetings with the COVID-19 advisory group. I was on, aware of them. On, on various issues, testing and the like. I was aware of them. In the period when you were Cabinet Secretary, only one such meeting took place, as far as we are aware, right at the end of the period in which we are interested to do with the future of COVID. Is it the case that in this significant health emergency, more reliance should have been placed on that expert group in order to assist with the response? Not necessarily. And, and the example that you gave, I think, is, is very pertinent. You mentioned the C19 group did a deep dive. I think you said testing or, or, or the like. So that's right. By this point, of course, we would have had a testing system, test and protect, well established, up and running, well underway, a vaccination programme, well understood, well established, well underway. So we wouldn't have to call the C19 advisory group back in to begin to do deep dives into well-established protocols. Given that Omicron uh, was another wave of the virus, although I absolutely accept fully that it was a more highly transmissible uh, variant of the uh, virus, uh, we knew what we had to do in, uh, when, when we were hit with waves. We knew we had to look at NPIs, we had to look at the route map, we had to look at the four harms considerations that we had to take. 
uh, and we had to make decisions on what action we were going to do based on the four harms, protecting people's health, the indirect health issues, societal impacts, and of course the impact on the economy uh, as well. But the C19 group I always knew, knew was available, should it be required um, uh, in, uh, during any point uh, in the pandemic. It may have been available, but what I'm suggesting to you is you didn't use it. But again, I go back to the point of why it wasn't used as often. Now, the C19 group would often engage with the CMO. The CMO would then, uh, I would have regular engagement with the CMO and then regular engagement, uh, sorry, the CMO would attend cabinet uh, virtually every single uh, week during this phase. Um, my point being is that the C19 group, as you yourself said, was there to help with deep dives into things like testing. Uh, these were already established. I wouldn't have to bring the C19 group back in to have a deep dive into testing established, vaccination established, and so on and so forth. But uh, again, uh, there was advisors available within the C19 group, should I have needed them bilaterally as well as part of a group. Even all those systems were in place, would that C19 group not have been able to assist with the strategy in this further emergency phase of the pandemic? I think, again, advisors, uh, I took advice from uh, clinical advisors, from the chief medical officer, from the uh, chief executive of the NHS, uh, from health boards directly, from experts in social care, a whole range of experts and advisors. Um, but I think uh, we knew, given that uh, we were facing this highly transmissible variant, one, one of the pieces of advice that we got was that we had to increase quite significantly <coughs> the booster vaccine a programme. And that's why the decision was taken to implement <coughs> what was known as the Boosted by the Bells programme, effectively getting as many people their booster vaccination uh, before the end of the year. What briefing did you receive on taking the post about <coughs> the role that vaccination was likely to play in the pandemic in Scotland in that period? Uh, when I first uh, came into role, again, I would have to look back over, uh, of course, paperwork, but uh, there was no doubt at all, even before I was in the role uh, as health secretary, that we all knew what a game changer the vaccination was. Now, the question when a new variant always came into place was whether or not it had uh, what was termed at the time, uh, still used uh, the terminology, immune escape. Um, and uh, for me, uh, there was no doubting at all when I had my first briefing with the chief medical officer, with the national clinical director and others, that the vaccination uh, was the game changer in how we respond to the virus and open our society back up as best we can in the face of, uh, of COVID-19. In her evidence, uh, Professor Devi Sridhar, she was, of course, a member of the COVID-19 advisory group, she explained that uh, at the time when the vaccination programme started, which was towards the end of 2020, increasing into the beginning of 2021, that her advice in her role in providing advice uh, relating to what was known within the four harm strategy as harm one, the harm caused by the virus, um, diminished uh, on the basis that um, her, her role had been more prominent in, in fighting the virus in the period before that. Was it the case that your impression of the vaccine being a game changer resulted in the fight against the virus, harm one, getting less attention than it ought to have done? That's not my impression at all. Uh, and maybe I'm saying this as the person who was Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, but harm one was always the one that was at the forefront uh, of my mind. Harm one and harm two were probably the ones that were at the most forefront uh, of my mind, given that I was Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, and social care uh, from May 2021 um, to, to the period uh, the, the, of interest uh, to you. Um, so for me, there was never any um, dilution, diminution of harm one. It was at the forefront of our minds as a government constantly throughout the course of the pandemic. As far as harm two is concerned, which you've mentioned, obviously that would fall within your remit as well, because although yes. it's not COVID harms, it's other health harms to remind people. Um, what information were you provided with in order to try to uh, manage the extent of that harm? Um, again, I think when we had conversations, we were alive and alert to obviously all four harms. In respect to harm two, particularly the impact on mental well-being, um, the most important thing that I could do was speak to those 
who are either directly impacted or represented those who are directly impacted by harm too, in particular if I think about the mental well-being aspects um, that uh, people suffered or chronic illnesses um, that they suffered, uh, then I would often engage uh, with those representative groups or indeed those with lived experience uh, directly, as well as getting the usual briefing. There would always be briefing uh, made available uh, when you first come into position. You're, 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 you're given uh, multitudes, plethora of, 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 of briefing to, to get your uh, head round. Um, but the best briefing, if I can put it that way, that I received in relation to harm too is undoubtedly the engagement with those that had been impacted, not by the direct effects of COVID-19, but the perhaps indirect uh, health consequences. Given the significant consequences which occurred over this period within the health service, um, non-urgent health care having to be cancelled in a number of health boards, is it not the case that, irrespective of the efforts that you have described as having taken with regard to harm too, significant non-COVID harm was caused to the people of Scotland over this period? There's no doubt at all that uh, when you cancel elective surgery, people waiting on a waiting list is, is, is not a benign act. There's completely, there's absolutely an impact so the discussion, on those individual. So, so the discussion, sorry. Uh, so, so there's undoubtedly an impact on their health. Uh, it may be chronic health, it may be that, that hip replacement that Mrs Smith needed and that she now had to wait had to wait a year later would undoubtedly mean further deterioration, deconditioning and then impacting the quality of her life. That was absolutely a harm that we had to try to balance. And that's why nobody took the decision, at health board level, government level uh, or any other level, to stop elective care lightly at all. We absolutely understood that if we took these decisions to protect people from and protect their, 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 their lives in relation to the first harm, harm one, then that would have an impact potentially on, on other aspects, including those that fall under the bracket of harm two. So during the period when you were Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, significant harm under harm one was done. The virus, the, the virus was rampant, thousands of deaths and record levels compared to the rest of the pandemic and the rest of the UK as regards to the number of infections. Is that correct? Well, I would say that the emergence of Omicron and, of course, the Delta variant that was more transmissible than the Alpha variant before it, that was the reason why we had high levels of infection. And in terms of COVID deaths, that was a result, of course, of the Omicron variant, not because, and I would contend, of particular policy choices that I made as Cabinet Secretary for Health or Social Care, or indeed that the government made. We were dealing with a highly transmissible uh, virus uh, that you have des rightly described in your earlier contributions uh, as uh, being far more transmissible than the, 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 the previous uh, variant. But yes, that resulted, I'm afraid, in a number of people uh, losing their lives. As far as harm too is concerned, again, I think the position is there was record levels of harm under harm too because of the hospital closures and pressures. Is that not correct? Again, your definition of record levels, but there were certainly people, because we took decisions to stop elective care, then they would be added uh, to uh, the waiting list. Of course, we took action to try to increase, for example, spend on mental health uh, as best we possibly could to try to make sure that we dealt with some of the harm to impacts, such as on people's mental well-being. One of the aspects of the management of the pandemic over this period uh, was a number of issues and questions that you had to address with regard to large-scale events. Would that be fair? Yes, absolutely. There were issues that arose about the Euros and the opening of fan zones in particular. Yes, Is that right? that's correct. And there was also the issue of uh, COP26 which has come up a few times in our evidence and the management of infection around that, given the number of people involved and the fact that that was obviously a, an unusual event. That's also correct, isn't it? That is correct, yes. Could we look please at the um, Euro uh, fan zone position? Again, yeah. some WhatsApps, please. Uh, INQ 00033472. This is an exchange um, between yourself and Jason Leach again, in which there is some discussion. 
uh, as one sees this regularly, discussion between the two of you about what you're going to do, what the solution is. And at uh, 13.39, um, you... I could just get that up. Um, yes, thank you. Um, you say, at its lowest over the last seven days, we saw Glasgow case numbers dip to around 87 cases. Obviously now seeing an increase over the last two days, test percentage remaining relatively stable. Understand FM's worry about losing the dressing room, but can't do anything other than leave Glasgow in level three for now. Big question, and opposition are asking it not unreasonably. What is the way out? Are we doing enough here to break the community transmission instead of just targeting the hotspots? Does enhanced testing, prioritising vaccines, etc., need to be done citywide? Then there's a, a further discussion about all of this, and then um, at 14.02, um, this is particularised in relation to the question about whether the Euros should be allowed to, well, whether events relating to the Euros should be allowed to proceed. Jason Leach says, and I agree, if trajectory continues and doesn't accelerate everyone down a level, that would allow Euros. Uh, he then says, cancelling crowds and the fan zone would be very difficult. 1404, you say, that's the danger, though. Football is on, pubs open, lots of people mingling indoors, including in households, to watch the game. All the while, Glasgow is still picking up 100-odd new cases a day. Um, and there's some surprise. Then over the page, 1407, you say, all that said, we will lose the dressing room. People want to watch the match with friends and family after waiting 23 years for Scotland to qualify. Um, further exchanges, and then you say at 1411, to mitigate the surge in cases, we will possibly see as a result of the Euros not better keeping Glasgow in level three as long as possible before the first game. Fanzo makes that tricky right enough. And then at 1429, Professor Leach says, so more testing, case finding exactly what we want. Um, as Trump said, the problem with you public health idiots is if you do tests, you find disease. So. This is a discussion between the two of you of the, about the, the case rises in Glasgow and the extent to which it would be wise to continue um, with the planned fan zone in Glasgow uh, to allow people to watch the Euros. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And I think your position here, as I understand it, is that you are quite concerned about whether these events could be allowed to go ahead, given the fact that the background is there's high levels of cases and you are rightly debating that with Professor Leach. Is that right? I'm very concerned. Yeah. Um, could we then go to uh, pages 12 to 13? I think it's the same exchange. Yeah, 4792. Uh, pages 12 to 13. This is now on the 10th of June. I'm looking at 10-6-2021 um, at 11.45. Yep. Uh, just up at the top there, you can see um, Professor Leach says, and it still goes on, FM wants more advice. Her instinct says cancel fan zone. Her office will write back, which Ken is writing to ask for more, and then Ken will gather the uh, legal, etc., to reply. Uh, then there's a further exchange. Um, you, you indicate that you've, there's been some attention paid to the cost of cancelling the event, which might be £6 million you raised the question of whether that would or would not include compensation for those who have lost money. Uh, and then at 11.55, um, Professor Leach says, yep, I think that's cost, not profit, in the £6 million analysis. Uh, and then he says, she needs to do it before or at FMQs, if at all. And you say, I'll tell you what, from knowing her for 15 years, it is not often her instincts are wrong. And I think ultimately the position is that the fan zone is allowed to go ahead. Does this exchange show um, you being very concerned, understandably, about the, the situation in Glasgow, but ultimately there being a reliance on the First Minister's instincts as to what to do? No, I think their uh, exchange uh, is an understanding that this is not an easy call. You've got high case numbers in Glasgow. You've got a huge footballing event for which Scotland have qualified for the first time in over 20 years. And you've got to make a decision about whether or not a fan zone, which is an outdoor, fairly regulated space, and I went to the fan zone to see it myself, and hand hygiene measures in place, 
one-way systems in place and so on. We put other mitigations, which I can talk to uh, as well. Do you have that highly regulated space? And if you don't have it, then do more people go into spaces which are more conducive to the transmission of the virus, i.e. into pubs or in each other's households, less ventilation, less regulation of the space? And which one do we go with? And ultimately, I remember the First Minister was asking questions to which, to be frank, we would not be able to answer. If you close the fan zone, how many people, extra people end up in pubs? Um, and therefore, there was these, this was, uh, 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 I think the message exchange demonstrates that this was not an easy decision to make. Um, and saying that, yes, uh, the First Minister, who the former First Minister had shown uh, very good instincts, uh, I believe, in relation to decisions being made in, in regards to the pandemic, there was ultimately a decision that, 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 that had to be uh, made here. And we had provided her clinical advisors. I had also spoken to her, of course, about the fan zone and given uh, my view, um, but it was not an easy decision uh, to make at all. I think ultimately the right decision was made given the mitigations that we were able to put in place in relation to testing and so on and so forth. My question was whether ultimately it was a matter which relied this very difficult situation with lots of different considerations, financial, health, moving picture. Ultimately, that relied on an instinctive uh, judgment by the First Minister. No, didn't rely on that. Uh, her instinctive judgment was important, but it relied on, uh, I think, being all of, all of those involved in the decision, uh, being confident that the appropriate mitigations were in place and understanding the impacts and potential effects of cancelling the fan zone and what that would mean for public health as well as other issues too. There's a further exchange at page 17, which is a little bit later, I think after perhaps the fan zone has at least to some extent been in existence. This is now on the 24th of June, um, looking at the exchange which starts at the 24th at 12.26. You're discussing, I think, the position um, with regard to the numbers, and you say, I would certain we'd be well above the 3,000 mark. Just doesn't feel right that we aren't effectively able to do anything in the immediate and short term to drive those numbers down, other than imposing restrictions, uh, which, as the FM says, the public just won't stand for. Professor Leach says, keep your fingers crossed, it is a temporary Euros phenomenon. The expression, keep your fingers crossed, is one which appears on a number of occasions in these exchanges. Is it the case by this stage that you are relying on instinct and luck to manage the pandemic? No, I would reject that charge in its entirety. Look, I'm, I was the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care. I was always going to be the guy in the Cabinet that pushed for us to go the hardest, the fastest, to do more in terms of NPIs and restrictions. I suspect that is true of every Health Secretary right across the United Kingdom. Um, that was often our, our position, and my position as Cabinet Secretary for Health was no different. So there was occasions in Cabinet and uh, uh, in Gold Command and other fora where I would be pushing harder, but ultimately there came a collective decision, and in this case, for example, um, the, First Minister, the former First Minister's belief that if we had imposed restrictions particularly during the Euros, the public just would not accept it. And that, of course, would be, you know, would, would be dangerous for compliance. And, and, and then we would not just lose the public, which was important in relation to future compliance, but we'd also have no impact on the virus either. Do you use the expression, as one, one of the passages I went to there, uh, to the possibility of losing the dressing room? That, that expression features on a number of occasions in your exchanges with Professor Leach. Again, at this stage, are you effectively uh, suggesting that although there is good evidence to suggest that more needed to be done, the concern was that you would lose the confidence of the public such that you just allowed the virus to run rampant? No, you see, it's not a case of simply losing the dressing room or the public won't stand for it. What that in effect means, of course, is that we, don't, we will not have compliance. And that is the worst of both worlds. So you end up in a position where people aren't complying. They just won't stand for it. At this point, we've been living 
with the virus uh, for over a year and people have been through numerous restrictions. So you get the bo worst of both worlds. They don't comply and then that therefore means that you continue to get increased levels and numbers of uh, cases. I think that was particularly, it was more difficult, I think, to bring forward the NPIs, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, when we had a vaccination programme also well underway and a testing system that was well established as well. But I go back to the central point in this exchange that we were facing an incredibly difficult set of circumstances with not just the fan zone, but uh, generally speaking, having lived for over a year with this virus, people's patients, understandably so, uh, with, with, with restrictions uh, wearing relatively thin. But at this stage, was it not possible to try to mitigate the possibility of losing the dressing room by using strategies you suggested were used early in the pandemic, explaining things to people, explaining what the data was, explaining why it was in their interest to uh, adhere to the restrictions? It seems here that there is a discussion about those risks, a discussion about that data, but you simply give up and rely on instinct. No, again, I don't agree that we, we gave up. There was, first and foremost, at this point, restrictions in place. It would be wrong for anybody to suggest there wasn't any level of restriction uh, in place. But what we also did was we took additional measures, particularly in relation to the fan zone, but also, of course, you'll be aware that in addition to the fan zone, uh, there was some matches being played at Hamden with a uh, reduced capacity. So we made sure that significant uh, mitigations were put in place in relation to testing availability, test kits being sent out to people, um, uh, mitigations around uh, hand hygiene, one-way systems, and so on and so forth. We took a, a number of mitigations. So this wasn't a case of, look, we're not going to take any action. We just have to live with what, what will happen. And ultimately, of course, the data it demonstrates that when we look at the Public Health Scotland COVID-19 statistical report of the 28th of June uh, 2021, uh, that between the 11th and the 28th of June, 1,991 people in Scotland with a COVID diagnosis were identified as having attended one or more Euro 2020 events during the infectious uh, period. But they were tagged uh, in terms of where the, what events they attended. Um, and nearly two thirds of the cases, 1,294 people reported travelling to London for a Euro related event uh, and game. Um, when we look at those who were tagged for the fan zone out of the 1,991, <coughs> 55 cases came as part of the, 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 the fan zone or travel to the fan zone. And the Scotland match against Croatia, 38 tags. And the Scotland match versus the Czech Republic, 37 tags. So really a small proportion of those positive cases um, went to the fan zone or indeed attended the game at Hamden. And that to me says that the mitigations we put in place uh, were relatively effective. Could I then follow this attempt to try and understand the decision-making process over this period in, into the later uh, variant emergence, which you mentioned yourself, the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, so if we could go then to, um, I think it's the same document, 4792 at page 45. So at this stage, late November, Omicron has started to become th the next issue that we have to deal with. I think that you say in your statement that there were... Um, some gaps in data around Omicron, which caused some issues around that time. Could, could you tell us, do you recall uh, what the gaps in data were around this period that caused difficulty in trying to come up with a strategy? In terms of Omicron, um, yes. I think... We if I could just, still... I could read the passage out if it's, it's more heavy, I might refresh your memory. I do recall times when there were gaps in the data, scientific information or advice, particularly in relation to a new variant. For example, when information emerged about a new COVID-19 variant, Omicron, in late November 2021, advisors were understandably unsure about the extent of immune escape or severity of Omicron. Scientific research was still in the early stages in South Africa, where Omicron was first identified, and while it was quickly established that it had a high transmission rate, other factors, such as how it would impact those who had the booster vaccine, were unknown. The lack of scientific understanding was communicated to Cabinet at the time, both from the CMO and in papers provided to Cabinet and taken into account when making decisions. So that there were, I think you're trying to say there that simply as a result of the fact it was a new variant, there was inevitably a lack of data about in the, one of the particular factors about it was whether there was going to be immune escape. 
such that the vaccines might not work as effectively against this new variant. Is that broadly correct? Yes, correct. Yes. And so at this stage, one might think that one required to reimpose or reconsider a precautionary approach because of the possibility that the great protector, the game changer, as you described it, the vaccine, may no longer be the protection which it might at once have been. Is that right? That is uh, one conclusion, yes. Is that a fair assessment of the approach which ought to have been taken? Um, well, again, it depends when the decision was taken, because every day we were learning more and more about the variant, its characteristics, possible immune escape, etc., etc. Mm. So if I could take you to an exchange, please, I'd taken you to page 45, sorry, before asking that question, at uh, the 13th of December at 1956. Yeah. Uh, discussion here in this context, where you, again, discussing, uh, as we see often uh, with Professor Leach, keep me updated on what comes out, FM call, I will be really disappointed if we end up with just window dressing, to which, at 2013, Professor Leach describes, it's window dressing. We edged her to limiting households everywhere. We, co we could, but it's marginal, nothing significant. You say, just don't get it. Take it, it's coming down to finance. So big events can continue. People can meet in as big as numbers as they like in pubs and restaurants. Madness. You say, working from home? Professor Leach says, all about money. Professor Leach says, yep, yes, in regs. You say, frustrating. Thought Kate, which I assume is a reference to uh, Ms Forbes, mm -hmm. um, have thought Kate might have pulled something out of the bag. Was she on the call? I might try and call her tonight. Uh, will have limited effect, I suspect, but be helpful to understand the analysis she has done of costs involved. So is the position here that you are suggesting that greater steps require to be taken to deal with this situation, but for, amongst other reasons, financial reasons, uh, those steps are not being taken, which is causing you a great deal of frustration? That is a fair summary. So uh, I remember this period mm. uh, very, very well. And I go back to the comments I made uh, a moment ago in response to a different question that you asked as Cabinet Secretary for Health. I was always going to be the person on the Cabinet table that was pushing the government to go further, to go faster, to go harder, uh, given that I was the one who was dealing with the health service on a day-to-day -day basis and seeing the impacts uh, on uh, the health service. I think the other important point of context around funding and finance here, which is exceptionally important, is, of course, by this point, I believe, the UK government had already significantly reduced, uh, if not entirely withdrawn, its funding in relation to business uh, support. So, therefore, if we were going to try to find money for business support, if we were going to introduce restrictions on hospitality, um, then we would have to find that compensation within the Scottish government's budget, which was already under extreme pressure, uh, given that we were still uh, fight we had been fighting the pandemic uh, that uh, whole uh, year. So there is no doubt that I had thought at this period in time that we should have gone further. And I'm not sure if it's quite at this time or slightly later in the month that we end up with an options paper around various different options that Cabinet considers. Now, it's no surprise that I am the one who opts for what I think was option C at the time, which was the one with uh, the most restriction uh, in place, including further restriction on hospitality uh, and uh, leisure. But we had to consider not just all four harms, which was our guiding light, but we had to consider uh, whether or not we would be able to compensate businesses or not if we added further restriction. So, yes, I think your summary uh, is fair. I wanted to go further, but ultimately that had to be a collective decision uh, that Cabinet would have had, uh, I, uh, considering all of the factors, uh, including uh, finance, of course, uh, as well as uh, ultimately uh, the priority, which is public health. But First Minister, over this period, as we described, there was considerable uncertainty as to what might happen. There was a threat from a new variant. Cases were rising. There was a need to take a precautionary approach, was there not? Uh, yes, and that's why uh, further uh, limitations were brought in. And you can see that from the exchange uh, with Jason. Uh, uh, limited households, limiting households everywhere. You know, but it's marginal, and I would have wanted us to go further. I think by this point, we also had a better understanding uh, about immune escape and that the vaccine was still very effective uh, against our booster. The dose of that vaccine was incredibly uh, effective against the Omicron variant. So again, as well as NPIs, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, we were also looking at how we would rapidly increase the level of vaccination as well. 
There are some further exchanges in this regard, expressing your frustration at the position the First Minister seemed to take. This period, the correspondence goes on in this vein over this period. If I could take you a bit further down, please, to the um, 5th of January 2022 at one nineteen. Sorry, one eighteen. <coughs> Page forty-eight, one eighteen. Um, it is yes, it is grim. You say, uh, but FM is right. Public aren't with us. They now hear what they want to hear. Less severe, one in ICU with <coughs> Omicron. Professor Leach says, yep, yep, I agree, and I kind of agree with them. I can't find any evidence of ICU increases or deaths globally, so it's a health service problem now. You say, so means we have to deal with the consequences, i.e. somehow ensure NHS doesn't completely collapse. I'm not entirely sure we can deliver on that, but I'm going to have to do everything in my power to make sure it doesn't. And then at 1.22 you say, we have asked a lot of the public, but we've lost the dressing room on this one. After 21 months, save the NHS isn't enough to stop them living their lives as close to normal as they can get. Does this exchange indicate, First Minister, that by this stage, in light of record numbers of cases and the NHS on collapse, you had lost the faith of the Scottish people such that the vir virus was able to run rampant without control? No, th that's not the interpretation. The interpretation is that we have, as we say in the exchange, it's highlighted, we have asked a lot of the public. That was true. Never, never in my life could I have imagined that I would ever be in a position uh, in politics that would require me, necessitate me, to now have to effectively keep people under lockdown. Not in effect. We did keep people in lockdown. This was the biggest decisions I think a government has ever made, certainly in recent times. And we didn't just ask the public to do that once. We asked them to live by these restrictions on multiple occasions. Um, so there's not a blame here, uh, neither in the public, but nor do I think it is correct to attribute blame uh, to the government for the fact that the public had had enough of restrictive measures. Um, but when you have a vaccination programme in place that was effective, when you have a testing system that's in place that has shown to be effective, then, and when we are seeing a new variant, but that new variant, uh, thankfully because of the vaccine, largely down to the vaccine, uh, is not causing as much severe illness, uh, perhaps, uh, as if we didn't have the vaccine, and people are hearing that there's one person in ICU, for example, with Omicron, then it would have been, if not virtually impossible, extremely difficult to impose uh, a level of restriction akin to lockdown that would have undoubtedly had the impact of reducing case numbers. But I don't think we would have had compliance uh, with, uh, from the public. I have two very brief further questions. I understand that during the course of your evidence, you, I think you alluded to this earlier in connection with the WhatsApp situation, that you have announced an externally led review into the Scottish Government's use of WhatsApp and non-corporate technology. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, that review will not have access to WhatsApps which have been destroyed by ministers and senior officials, will it? No. I have no further questions, my lady. Uh, there are some pre-Rule 10 questions from Ms Mitchell. There are. Ms Mitchell. <coughs> First Minister, I appear as instructed by Amar Anwar and Company on behalf of the Scottish Covid Bereaved. I wish to ask you some questions, particularly in relation to COVID symptoms. Um, the, I would like a document brought up, please. It is INQ 00027395, paragraph 341. I'll start by explaining that paragraph says 
In 2020, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport would have received advice from scientific and clinical experts in relation to the risk of transmission within care homes of patients being discharged to care homes from hospital care. The Scottish Government were aware that older people were more at risk of serious illness from the virus, but in the initial stages of the pandemic, there was an evolving understanding of asymptomatic transmission. As the knowledge and understanding grew, our testing regime was changed accordingly in response. And then you explain that um, this is why uh, there was a change in routinely testing um, from those uh, from hospital to care homes who were asymptomatic to testing all people moving from hospital to care homes on 21st of April 2020. We see from our, our discussion of Cabinet meetings that the issue of care homes was frequently discussed. And I would like to ask you, as, you, as, as a, a member I appreciate of the Cabinet, but not as the um, member who had specific responsibility for this, but nevertheless a, a member of the Cabinet who was making these decisions, what was your um, understanding and when did you become aware of the possibility of asymptomatic transfer of COVID-19. Now, before you respond to that, I, I use the word possibility um, with care, not when did it become clear that that was an issue, but can you recall when the live issue of asymptomatic transfer was a possibility? Uh, thank you. And can I reiterate now that I'm speaking directly uh, to you and as the representative of Scottish COVID bereave, can I reiterate that apology that I made at the beginning uh, for the way that we've handled the WhatsApp uh, issue. It was not good enough and it's caused, I know, uh, serious grief and re-trauma for those that you represent. And there's no excuses for me that should have been handled better and in the future uh, will be handled uh, better. In relation to the substance of your, your question, I couldn't give you an absolute date of when the possibility became clear. But as you can imagine, many of us in government, regardless of whether they were health secretary at the time or not, have reflected on this issue and this question of asymptomatic testing for those who are being discharged from hospitals into care homes. And there will be a long list of potential lessons that the government and governments could have learnt. Um, I think the issue around asymp possible asymptomatic transmission of the virus was known as a possibility early on through various international uh, journals, through various academic uh, academic uh, articles. And there will be a number of things that we could have done better. It is in my view, as the current First Minister, that we should have been testing those who were leaving hospitals, going into care homes who were asymptomatic sooner than we actually did. And can I press you when you say early when are we talking about? January, February? Forgive me, I, I couldn't recall exactly um, when, when that was. So I, I suppose implicit in, your, um, in, implicit in your response was that you were aware of the possibility of asymptomatic transfer at the time it was decided to move people from hospitals into care homes. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, I, I would certainly say that pre the 21st of April 2020, uh, I think it would be fair to say that there was a possibility, and that was the word you very specifically used, because it wasn't clear, it may not have been clear uh, well in advance of that date, but it was certainly a possibility that asymptomatic transmission could have happened. And therefore, as I say, if there's an area of reflection that I think about very often, uh, it is um, whether we should have, and it is my view actually, we should have perhaps more routinely tested those moving from hospital to care homes who are asymptomatic sooner. Well, I understand that you've reflected upon that, and that's your view now. Can you explain to the inquiry what you're thinking, what the impact of that was at the time, what your thinking was at the time when you decided, well, there might be a possibility of asymptomatic transfer, but I'm still going to, trans uh, I'm still going to be a collective part of a decision to transfer from the hospital environment into the care home yes. environment. So I, I can try to talk you through that to the best of my ability. So first of all, is that issue of around a possibility. And I should say at this point, I also had a family member in a, a care home, uh, my, my, my wife's gran, uh, who's in the care home uh, to this day. And therefore, we always try to understand this, uh, the issues that were affecting uh, care home relatives in particular, uh, and those who are in care homes. Um, because for them, it wasn't their care home, it was, it was, it was their home. In terms of 
the possibility, the various factors we had to consider were, at this point, in early days of the pandemic, we were extremely concerned about the overwhelming of the NHS and whether or not we would have the sufficient bed capacity or not, particularly in advance of any vaccine. The other thing that we had to consider was the testing infrastructure. Now, the testing infrastructure built up over a period of months and years, uh, even, but certainly over a period of months, we were able to ramp it up. But we did have limitations in terms of the testing infrastructure and also the reliability of tests, uh, rapid tests, uh, which became, again, evolved over time to become far more accurate uh, than they were. Um, but when it became clearer, because uh, we talked about a possibility of asymptomatic transmission, when it became clearer, of course, then we moved to a position of uh, routinely testing. But prior to that time, it appears that balancing things out, that was a risk you, you had to take. I don't think it, we were always trying to balance a number of factors um, and, and, and risks. Um, overwhelming of the NHS, nosocomial infection, impact on care homes, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and may, so, I, may I move on to my next question, and that is in relation to the changing picture of COVID symptoms over the piece. Now, we've heard evidence even as early um, as February and certainly in March um, of 2020, we heard evidence from Dr Donald McCaskill saying that um, they were aware uh, at um, Scottish Care that um, symptoms demonstrated as being COVID symptoms were not manifesting in the same way as in a population which was particularly old and with multiple core mor uh, morbidities. And uh, we have then, at a later stage, June 2020, Public Health Scotland, highlighting the fact that symptoms in the elderly are different, and also uh, Public Health Scotland in uh, June 2021, indicating that older compromised residents may present with atypical or non-specific symptoms and list them. Milady, for reference, that is INQ 00024655. After you became Cabinet Secretary in, uh, for Health and Social Care in May 2021, you met um, the group now known as the Scottish COVID Bereaved on the 17th August 2021. And during the course of that uh, conversation, they raised with you the issue of COVID-19 symptoms being restricted to temperature, persistent cough, and a loss of sense, uh, a sense of taste or smell. And you recall that you confirmed that the UK Health Security Agency was responsible for the symptoms and would not, at that stage, change it. You say that in respect of the steps taken to revise the symptoms, um, you recall inquiring with the CMO as the potential scope for expanding the line of symptoms. In that regard, um, this would be um, Gregor Smith that you would have been asking. Do you recall if you asked him in person or in writing? Um, uh, uh, forgive me, it certainly would have been uh, in person. Uh, I, I can't remember whether or not there was also a written exchange, be that over informal communication or, 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 or formally. But um, it, the Scottish COVID bereaved, of course, raised it, as you rightly say, and that's minuted. It was also raised by other groups as well that there may be additional symptoms. And there was, of course, primary core symptoms and then uh, what was known as sometimes as secondary uh, symptoms. But ultimately, these were clinical decisions. There's no way that I, nor the previous DFM, who met the Scottish COVID but, No, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, First Minister. I'm just wanting to see whether or not you, you asked him. And presumably, he followed that up, because in the paragraph yes. you give, we don't hear what the response was. Can you remember what the response? Yes, he would have had a discussion with the other CMOs of the United Kingdom. And uh, for uh, their clinical expertise would have been to maintain those core symptoms uh, as they were. Now, they would have taken a whole raft and range of clinical advice and user clinical expertise to come to that decision. And I, and I go back to saying that ultimately it was always going to be a clinical decision. But finally, why, when health is a devolved matter, did it require the UK Health, Agency, health Security Agency to identify the symptom profile as fed into it by the four CMOs? Because why it, couldn't Scotland go its own way in that regard? Yeah, uh, I think, in essence, if we had, if the CMO and the clinical advice had come back to say very strongly that we believe that there should be X, Y, Z symptom added to the core symptoms, that may have been a possibility. Um, I think we were very, very keen in this sense to try to keep uh, UK alignment, uh, to try to make the issue more simply understood uh, in relation to the core symptoms right across uh, the UK. But this, again, I go back to the point, was always going to be 
an issue of clinical advice as opposed to ministerial decision or direction. My lady, those are my questions. Thank you, Ms Mitchell. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, First Minister. Very grateful to you. Sorry about the constant coughing. I'm afraid it's been a feature of this inquiry, um, certainly in Scotland. Um, I'll see everybody on Monday at 10am. Thank you, my lady. <laughs>